For anyone here tonight, you're being videotaped as the planning department for the city asked BevCam to tape, tape tonight's meeting. So kindly be, be on notice that if you participate in any one of our public hearings uh, by making public comments, um, as you're welcome to do so, but you're being videotaped. Thank you. All right, good evening. My name is Keith Mercy. I'm an architect from Castle Boost Associates on behalf of the City of Beverly for the new Beverly Police Station. Um, since our meeting last month, I just want to give you a couple quick updates on our schedule. Since the last planning board meeting, we have um, submitted and been approved by Conservation Commission. Our traffic study has been submitted and was approved by the Traffic and Parking Commission this morning. And then our continuance of the planning board this evening. Um, having said that, I'd like to hand over the rest of the presentation to Luke McCoy, landscape architect from Castle Boos. Thank you. Um, all right. What I'd like to do is just very briefly um, go back through just to re-familiarize everyone with the project and the site um, since it's been a little while since we've been here before. Again, the parcel uh, that is proposed for the new police station is located here within the coming center off of Elliott Street. Um, it is the frontmost left, uh, right corner of that site right there. Um, it's approximately two acres in size. And the proposed plan uh, is as shown here. This is the same plan you saw last time. There's been no revisions to the overall layout design uh, of the project, including grading, drainage, uh, all of that with the project. Um, one piece that um, we did go through last time, we wanted to make sure it was clear on the record, was that the building is set approximately six feet above sea level. We know that that was discussed last time and there's correction made, so I just want to make sure that is in uh, with the record. Again, the main entrance into the Cummings, the four-way intersection is here which will be used for the main entrance into the police um, station site. Public parking uh, and access will be right here directly off of, be able to come in. There's parking spaces, still have the ability to access the ATM that is located there. The police um, parking and vehicles will all be to the rear of the building, which will be a secured parking lot and will not be accessed by public. The secondary, um, uh, curb cut for the site is located here. Again, that will be for police uh, emergency vehicles only. That will not be used for public. It will be signed as such um, and is part of the conditional approval that was received this morning based on the Parking and Traffic Commission um, with it as well. And they've reviewed all of this as well as the updated, um, the traffic study that was submitted to this commission um, since the last meeting. And again, that meeting was held this morning. And we just received, so I want to, I'm going to assume that it was also submitted, um, their findings from this morning's meeting um, to this group, so, uh, as well. So we do appreciate that they turned that around so quickly to you all uh, for tonight. Um, oh, too many clickers here. So, um, again, just to give you an idea of context of the building, again, you've seen this. We've been through design board, but just to re-familiarize yourself, um, this would be... Um, the public entrance side here, the rest all through and around the back of the building is all secured entrance uh, for the uh, police department. Um, again, just very quickly, traffic flow uh, for this. Again, coming in off of the Elliott Street entrance, as I just mentioned, you have the access to the ATM as well as parking for the public. There are currently proposed 12 spaces, which is one above the requirements uh, of the regulations now. So. It's actually 11 um, required. We have proposed 12. Uh, the remainder of the site starting uh, in this area is all gated and fenced for um, the police department only access. Um, and then that secondary entrance exit, as you see here, is only for uh, emergency vehicles coming in and out. Um, we touched on it briefly um, last time uh, in regards to the overall personnel that are within the department. Um, as well as the um, six patrols per shift. Um, Ian laid out for you the shift times, which were taken into account with the traffic study. Uh, the results summarized out of that study that was received not only by this commission, but also the commission this morning, 
uh, was that there was no significant impact on the area of the intersection, um, and there was minor impacts that are related to the relocation of existing um, traffic. The recommendations out of the report and as well as part of the conditions from the commission this morning uh, was to look at signalized timing adjustments, which would happen post-construction if this project is approved, and also the um, signal uh, uh, reinforcement of that police-only um, curb cut off of Elliott Street to make sure that that is clearly defined uh, and not used as a, as a public way for any reason. Um, again, um, with that, that summarizes what we discussed last time and then an update on the traffic um, portion in the traffic study, which was um, the piece that was still outstanding from last time. And we welcome additional questions. Do you expect to secure the public from getting to that uh, east exit from the property? Will they be able to get back there? <laughs> Got to get my steps in today, I guess. So we have the uh, uh, vehicles come in exit out through the sally port and it's also gated so there's a series of gates that surround and make sure that that's secure so that vehicles cannot get back into there so, as well as adding signage as was talked about yep so then just to clarify um if uh for cars that are um inadvertently turning into that um lot or that driveway is there ample space for them to turn around what's the the modem they for them if would that? have to do a u-turn may possibly be a k-turn to say, depending on the size of the vehicle if it's a larger suv type and come right back out and again it would be signed as right turn only as part of the condition from this morning's approval so if someone did happen to by chance not being paying attention maybe their gps was a little quick to tell them to turn right they would to come in, make a quick U-turn, and be able to get out. But again, they would not be able to go beyond because it's all closed and secure um, for a number of different reasons. Yeah. Just to be clear, you said that that secondary exit was is only for emergency vehicles. So does that include routine police vehicles or something Yes, else? they would be considered emergency vehicles. So any of the department vehicles leaving on a shift would be coming out through um, that secure entrance. And that's a right turn only, just Correct. to be clear. Based on the condition from this morning's approval, yes. It is to be signed as a right turn only coming out. Okay, I assume it, it's also signed, do not enter emergency vehicles Yes, only. would be on the opposite side of the sign, so yeah. a post would be double-sided. So in that instance, someone, again, would see that as, as not an entrance, but if they happen to, they have room to turn around and come out. But the goal is that they would see that do not enter emergency vehicles only. Do you have any information on how often that secondary exit is, is used presently and how often a left turn is executed there? Currently, um, I'm going to turn it over to our traffic consultant to answer those uh, more detail. Hi, I'm Christine Chiarkis from Van Asseng and Breslin, and I did the traffic study for this for the police station. Um, I will pull up the exact numbers, but under existing conditions, I believe in the morning, approximately 200 vehicles are entering and exiting, total entering and exiting, and in the evening, it's about 150. Um, those are the existing. I think that left turns currently entering in, which is currently an illegal movement based on the Gore kind of paved median, um, during the morning, there's 40 vehicles making a left turn into the, into the driveway, and in the evening, there's about 40 vehicles making the left turn out, and the rest of the turns are rights. There's no sign currently. There is no sign currently. I was informed that at some point in the past, it, one, it had been gated a number of years ago, but that in a fairly recent past, it had been signed as no left turn, and that sign is no longer there. So there's a 
fair amount of traffic that'll move from the secondary in and out to the primary Correct. in and out, which is signed and regulated as opposed to the secondary, which is not signed and regulated. Correct. Okay, thank you. Just a quick follow up about that. So would that still be uh, left lane, uh, left turn prohibited with emergency vehicles with the, if this project is approved? Yes. Okay. There we go. There we go. Um, Parking and Traffic Commission has as one of the conditions that there will be a post-development analysis of traffic impact following occupancy of the police station. Um, what's the time period in terms of after occupancy? Do you anticipate that the, the study will be done? Uh, typically, we like to do it about six months post-occupancy. Um, that would, the exact time frame was not determined. Thank you. It's also going to be approximately a 16-month construction time also. We'll open it up to members of the public who wish to speak. Good evening, everyone. Steve Drahoski from Cummings Properties. Uh, we are in support of this, this project. We're happy to see that lot finally be invested in by the city, and we're, uh, we'll be proud to have the safest ATMs in the city of Beverly, uh, which are right next to the, next to the station. Uh, we've, we've raised a, a few concerns over the past few months about this project and they are in general uh, parking traffic access over our property to get to the to the police station uh, as as one two uh, drainage this uh, you heard that the building will be raised five or six feet uh, the water needs to go somewhere uh, we know that the drainage on route 62 doesn't um, handle what's sent to it three a uh, hundred foot antenna, which was originally proposed but is no longer proposed, and uh, four, there is a large, I'll take, the, uh, I'll take it uh, with me, there is a large installation of IT infrastructure that serves coming center that comes basically through the building into the southern, fa or the, the southern face of 100 coming center and uh, serves most of our clients. That, the city proposes to move that and we're, we're a bit concerned on how that gets done. Uh, we have been, I've had a bunch of discussions with various people at the city, most, uh, most frequently Kevin, and uh, numbers two, three, and four, we think are addressed. Uh, we'd like to see them conditions to this approval. The city doesn't seem to want them to be the conditions of this approval, we're okay with that. Uh, we do have a proposed condition for access which I guess I could share with the board. So by way of background, uh, when this property was donated to the city, it was taking, and Cummings Properties donated back the value of the property, there was a taking document executed with the city. It contemplated a license, a non-exclusive license for the city to use land uh, that we continue to own to access the property. It envisions a detailed license will be entered. We need to still do that. So this condition uh, attempts to put that into the record. Great. Dra I'm, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't seen the parking, the parking letter. So two, three, and four being drainage the antenna, and moving of the IT infrastructure. So we've been told that the drainage system, which we know backs up on Route 62 and floods this intersection uh, in a matter of minutes, sometimes in a heavy rainstorm, is really, uh, this problem is related to an a inadequate piping in Route 62. We've been told that that will be repaired. Uh, the drainage proposal for what's gonna be handled from this site 
seems adequate, but we know where it goes is to pipes that don't, can't handle it. So we've been told that that'll be addressed. That's two. Three was the antenna, no longer a 100-foot antenna proposed. Um, I might not get the numbers exactly right, but Kevin told me as of yesterday, it'll be a 10, 10 by 10 space on the roof of the building, rather, and multiple antennas. So we were concerned about the appearance of a 100-foot antenna between the police station building and coming center. That no longer will be, will be an issue. So we're fine with that. And then we will work out the details on moving the IT infrastructure. So those are two, three, and four. One is parking, access, egress, and we have a proposed condition for one. Steve, with respect to the IT infrastructure that's currently in place, is there an easement? There is no easement written uh, as far as we know. We haven't found one. How is it that Cummings ended up with their IT infrastructure under land owned by the city of Beverly? Don't know. It was all part of the United Shoe Machinery uh, facility at one point. We purchased the North Parcel, which included that. Uh, and I don't, it predated every, everyone's, rec, predates everyone's recollection that I work with. Uh, Tim Parziali, who oversees construction at Cummings Center, has been with the company for 30 years. And we think it was there, but we don't know when it was installed. So there were pre-existing conduits that were, obviously there was no IT when the United Shoe was in business, right? right? So right. that's not a pre-existing condition. Um, so there were what, conduits that were used that, that wires were then pushed through? Conduits that uh, wires are pushed through that uh, provide phone service, as we understand it, as well as uh, telecom or uh, IT connectivity. Okay. And have you been in, have you had a conversation with the city with respect to that? And is Cummings' position that rather than an easement is that you would prefer to see that moved? No, our, our feeling is that the, the infrastructure can stay the way it is and can go under the building. The city would prefer not to have it under the building. Yeah. It is proposed to move it, and we're okay with that as well, as long as it doesn't interfere with the service that our clients rely on every day. Okay. That may be an unrealistic expectation, because I suppose if they're going to be moving telecom, et cetera, there'd be a brief inter interruption in service. So is that something that... that the Cummings property has discussed with the city at all? Because if we were to make moving it a condition, there, I think that the city wants it moved. So if the city were to move it, and if your expectation there will be zero interruption, I'm not sure that's a realistic expectation. So I guess I'm wondering what Cummings is, is proposing. I think our expectation is that the new uh, route would be laid, conduits would be laid, wires would be run, and then there would be a switch at 3 o'clock in the morning. Gotcha. And hopefully everyone needs to reset in the morning and they're up and running. Right. We're comfortable with that. We we're trying to simplify this as much as we can. We had four concerns and we had anticipated, we asked for this meeting to be postponed a month so we could work on the conditions. Uh, for those four items. The city would prefer not to do that. The city wants to keep moving. Uh, so we were, we, were at, we were forced to ask however you want to put it in the last uh, 24 hours to think about what really needs to be a condition and uh, we've whittled it down to one. And you expressed, I think you expressed overall concerns, parking, traffic, drainage, the antenna. And do you have the, specific parking and traffic concerns? We do. We do. We received the parking, uh, the traffic uh, study Friday afternoon. We haven't had the time to thoroughly investigate it. Uh, we asked for some time to do that. The Parking and Traffic Commission uh, felt that the, the, I think you saw it on the slide here, that the, the proposed impact is negligible or no significant impact. Um, we, we wanted a little bit more time to think about how moving all of those trips off the east entrance into Center Drive and then adding the occupancy load from the, the station onto Center Drive, how does that affect things? We know that the timing on uh, Route 62 can be a bit finicky, uh, not always easy to, to regulate. We've understood that it's, we're pretty close to the limits of the technology, so we, we wanted to look at it a little bit more thoroughly.
William, did you have a question? Given that I gather the city has a different view about the status of the um, of the access, uh, which we obviously can't resolve one way or the other, who's who's right about that? Um, and leaving aside the issue you just raised about your need for additional time to look at the parking traffic study, um, I'm just raising the question of how 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 we could possibly include a condition or not include a condition based on some assumption about who's right about the issue of uh, access over the Cummings property. And that's either for you or, or anybody well, just raising the question. Our first instinct, should I ask, answer? Our first instinct was that that is something that is best to get worked out before we come here. Um, but as a second choice, a distant second for us is to include a condition in this board's approval of the project that there needs to be an agreement between the city and Cummings properties on access that would support the building before a building permit is issued. Aaron, did you want to weigh in? Thank you, Steve. Uh, Aaron Clausen, city planner, uh, planning director for the uh, city of Beverly, for the record. Um, it is the city's position that uh, the city already has access uh, to the site um, and would suggest that um, if the planning board does decide to uh, approve the site plan um, as it's been presented, um, if there is any change to that site plan based on uh, outcomes of the discussion between Scumming Center uh, and the city of Beverly that uh, any change to the site plan would need to come back to the planning board for uh, an amendment anyway. And so it would suggest a condition of approval is not necessary to ensure that the planning board retains its, its authority to approve the site plan under the, the zoning board or the zoning regulations. Just while we have you, can you address the other concern raised by Cummings about not having adequate time to look at the uh, parking traffic study. Sure, I would. I would say that um, you know it is a project that's moving quickly. Um, we have a, a timeline that we're trying to meet. Um, the parking and traffic commission received uh, the traffic study at the same time, and was able to review it uh, thoroughly for the meeting this morning. Uh, I would say it's a pretty straightforward traffic study. Um, uh, it's a deep analysis. Provides existing conditions. Um, it provides uh, a future no build and build condition that uh, I think lays out a pretty simple uh, two-step set of conditions that the, the commission decided to recommend to the planning board consider. And one of them is the right turn right out and restrictions on the, on the uh, access drive to the east of the property. Uh, the second one is the, the um, post-construction uh, assessment that is con uh, consistent with the scope of the traffic analysis that was submitted to the board as well as the commission with the idea that, that that analysis would inform any kind of uh, optimization of the traffic signals, particularly the traffic signal that provides access at Elliott and the main entrance to Cumming Center. Um, that is the signal that does see some minor degradation in the future and no build and build condition. It's not just the build condition. Uh, but uh, as presented in the traffic study by VHB, they were able to show that minor adjustments to the uh, control, the timing of the signals, uh, would actually improve the future build condition over existing conditions. So short story is that a fairly simple adjustment to the traffic signal could improve the situation over the current condition. So the, the commission felt um, very comfortable with that in assessment. Steve, is your concern the lack of time to consider the recommendation of the parking and traffic Commission, or is your concern um, not enough time to look at the traffic study? Because I do note that the traffic study was completed on September 26th. Uh, we have not seen the uh, we haven't seen the recommendation from the Parking and Traffic Commission from this morning. We haven't seen the written uh, recommendation, but the parking uh, the, the traffic study was delivered to us Friday afternoon via email. So we our concern was that we didn't have time 
to have our expert take a look at it and give us his thoughts as to um, what what it says. We're not tra we're not traffic experts. We certainly have experience. We we've, we're developers. We've been here before talking about tra traffic impacts for sure, uh, but we would have liked that time. So we we respectfully disagree with Aaron that um, if in a perfect world we'd have more time to understand the traffic, ask questions, have our expert take a look at it, and come back with some uh, a response, a timely response. In uh, a little less perfect world, we would like there to be a condition that uh, requires us to come to an agreement on access to coming center to support this police station. We disagree with the city's view on what that 2001 document says. Okay, but I think we're talking about two different subjects here. We, One is the access issue, and then the other issue is your concern about the lack of time for you and or your expert to give due consideration to both the, the, the uh, traffic study and the recommendation of the Parking and Traffic Commission. Yes. I will say that, just make sure that all board members know that you have a letter in your package from City Solicitor Stephanie Williams stating that in her legal opinion and the city's position and her legal opinion is that the city does have access to it. And I think the point Mr. Clausen made about that is that's the assumption that's in the site plan we're asked to look at. And if that assumption turns out to be wrong because uh, Cummings is right, then they would have to come back to us. So I'm satisfied with, with that piece. And Steve, your issue, can you elaborate please on your issue with drainage? Uh, we, we've experienced, we know when it rains hard, we worry about a coming center pretty frequently. We worry about the confluence of high tide, heavy rain, and storm surge. So we know when we have uh, all three of those or maybe two of those, of, of those uh, there is some flooding that it, we experience at the bottom right corner of this lot, in the parking lot. and we. Uh, the catch basins seem to work fine, but what the catch basins are attached to, which is a pipe that runs east-west under Route 62, um, gets overwhelmed. So it backs up on the, on the lot that will become the public safety lot, and it also will create a nine inches or a foot of water in that intersection between Stop and Shop and Cumming Center in a matter of a couple of minutes. So we've talked about that with uh, Mike Collins, Kevin Hartunian brought it to everyone's attention, and we've received assurances that that issue that's off-site, um, the pipe to which the new drainage that serves the police station will connect will be improved, and that should no longer be a problem. We would be happy to see that happen. So you're satisfied with the city's representations to you about that? Yes. Okay. Other members of the public who wish to speak on the topic? Please come up, sir. Steve, I'm presuming you're all set. Except that I'd love to share this proposed condition at some sure, point. Sure, that's fine. Thank you very much. Ron Coster, 14 Atlantic Avenue, Beverly. <clears throat> I am concerned about the drainage, uh, in, which has been mentioned in a flood tide or in a high tide situation. Uh, LA Street is lower than the um, level of a high tide in the river, Bass, the uh, Bass River. And I wondered how <clears throat> that was going to be um, addressed, or if it has been addressed, uh, how that was going to be uh, remediated. Thank you. Does the applicant wish to respond to the issue on drainage? Uh, good evening, Bob Griffin from Griffin Engineering. The um, <coughs> proposed drainage improvements on site 
um, will improve the flow of water from the Cummings parking lot and from the police station out into Route 62. There's some uh, undersized pipes within the parcel right now that will be replaced with adequately sized pipes. The proposed police station has a s slightly more uh, green surfaces on the property than exist today, so there's going to be a slight reduction in stormwater coming off of the property as a result of the site layout. Insofar as the elevation difference between the intersection between Stop and Shop and the Cumming Center and the Bass River, we're really not proposing to change that as part of this project. I think that there may be some improvements coming down the road uh, to improve the flow of water east-west in Elliott Street, but the project that's in front of us this evening is really just a police station project and the uh, utilities directly associated with that. Other members of the public who wish to speak? Maureen Driscoll, uh, 11 Ocean Street, Beverly. Uh, I am a member also of the Bass Haven Yacht Club. And that drainage pipe, I believe that that drainage pipe that you refer to goes underneath Stop and Shop parking lot and under the Bass Haven Yacht Club. Am I correct? I'm assume, assuming that it's the one I can see. When we have, I have been down there in the past, about two years ago, when the uh, part of the yard, the lowest part of the yard cub yard was indeed flooded um, because it is, number one, there are, we don't have drainage built in. But the other part is that at that point in time, the drainage pipe, which goes under Stop and Shop, and I assume is the one that you're referring to, is well below, it exits well below the high tide line. And when it's pushed by a storm, um, and the water is right at the top of that bank, the parking lot or our storage yard fills. So I'm assuming also that this building is designed for 100 years. I, I really, the, I'm not sure what high tide or what tide line, sea level you refer to, what the data behind it is, but um, I can definitely foresee more flooding in that area within the next 10 years, 15 years. And I'm, I'm concerned that six feet of elevation above whatever that mean high water or whatever it is, is not sufficient. Anybody? Uh, just to address the elevation question, I did check the elevations as I was sitting there. The, the elevation of the intersection is about elevation seven and a half which is about three feet above mean high water, but which is elevation four and a half. So we aren't going to do anything to, you know, adjust the grade of Elliott Street as in conjunction with this project. And the commenter is correct that if sea levels rise and mean high water all of a sudden comes to a higher number than four and a half, then that uh, intersection may become flooded more often than happens today. But really that's independent of anything that we're doing at the police station. The police station, in order to protect it from uh, storm conditions has been raised significantly above the 100-year floodplain. So the 100-year floodplain at this site and in this portion of the river is elevation 10. So you can imagine if we had a flood at elevation 10, there would be two and a half feet of water in that intersection in front of the stop and shop and in front of the coming center. But the floor of the police station is going to be up at elevation 14. It's going to be four feet higher than that 100-year flood elevation. Um, so it's going to be significantly above that. The parking lot around the police station is going to be above the 100-year flood elevation. Um, so there'll be a, sort of a, a high spot in that part of town. Uh, so if, if sea levels do rise, we are going to see uh, flooding conditions potentially in Elliott Street more often than happen today and potentially for longer durations. But I think the police station is well protected. And I don't think we're doing anything at the police station that's going to really affect the performance of that intersection specifically. Mr. 
Mr. Collins. Hi, uh, Mike Collins, Commissioner of Public Services. Just to clarify, this is a separate drainage system from the one that goes, that services stop and shop and discharges through the Bass River. This, this drain uh, discharges a little bit opposite, right opposite McKay Street. So it's, it is a separate, uh, the, what you see at the, behind the Bass Haven, by the, um, behind stop and shop is just stop and shop drainage. Thank you very much. We're also pursuing a larger project. We have, we have uh, received some federal funding. We're, tr we're pursuing the permits to put a tide gate on the end of the pipe that this does drain to, because that'll be one of the ways that we can harden from future sea level rise. Um, but it's going to be a long permitting process. Thank you. Anyone else from the public who wishes to be heard? Okay, thank you. Um, board members, uh, before, um, I'm sorry. Um, I, before we make a decision as to whether or not to close the public hearing, I think we have to first make a consideration as to whether or not we want to give Cummings um, more time to consider the parking and traffic report and uh, and the Parking and Traffic Commission recommendation. Because if we do, then uh, we, we, I don't think we should close the public hearing because we would want to, them to have the opportunity to respond. So my question is, what is the will of the board with respect to um, keeping this public hearing open and giving Cummings the time that they're asking? Aaron, did you want to be heard? And I say this knowing that there is desire to move this project along. I was just going to reiterate that it's uh, very important for the city in meeting the timeline that it's trying to achieve to get the building built, um, that this moves forward tonight, and would ask that the planning board consider that. Well, I understand and I respect that. I personally think that given the circumstances that, th that this this is a property that is part of the coming center that given that they were they received the report Friday it, this is just my personal opinion that fundamental fairness to me would would give them the necessary time to consider Yes, I would just opine that uh, there are only two conditions that we're considering, which is signal timing adjustments and signage to the secondary driveway. There are only those two conditions, correct? I understand that. But again, I think that they, their position is that they have not had time, full, full and adequate time to consider the report. We're meeting in, what, two weeks, the 22nd? So three weeks. That was going to be my question, was what meeting are we talking about? If I could just make a note is that it's not uncommon for the Parking and Traffic Commission to make a quick judgment and a thorough quick judgment, and this is not necessarily out of the ordinary. Uh, other projects have come before the Parking and Traffic Commission where they've been able to review and respond in less than a week. There's no deadline um, that uh, the Parking and Traffic Commission requires submittals. There's, there is um, you know, practice where we look for uh, submittals to be submitted to the commission uh, a week before the meeting but it's not necessary it's not like the planning board where there's a deadline um, and i would again just say that it's a straightforward study it doesn't take a lot of time and analysis to review it and and come to a determination the i appreciate that thank you i guess my thought would be is the difference between the um the coming center is if they wanted to review versus they want to have their own experts perform their own study is there um could you speak to that no, we're, we're. we weren't planning on another study we would just have a, a traffic expert take a look at the report the reports i think in total it was more than 300 pages um, so we would just have somebody who's more accustomed to looking at those things than we are take a look at it and give us give us their opinion Okay, I need to interrupt the discussion just for a moment. We have a public hearing scheduled for 7.45. We can push that back, right? 
why don't we uh, why don't we push back the 745 to 755? Can I get a motion for that, please? Is there a second? Seconded by William. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, so the 745 hearing is pushed back to 755. So now we're back to the parking. I mean, the uh, coming. Yes. There we go. Here it comes. Um, if I could suggest a, a thought. Um, we know that many people are here to discuss or hear about the Depot 2 project. I think it would be, it would be fine uh, for the board to move this discussion to a later time in the meeting and begin the conversation around Depot 2. I don't think 10 minutes will make a difference. You don't think ten, well, 10 that's, minutes. That's, that, I think we should, you just, we have a motion to move it to 755? We just voted yeah. to approve okay. it. Okay, yeah. so that's fine. Um, staying on topic with the police station, and Ellen, you had asked with respect to Cummings having some additional time to look at the parking traffic. Uh, my two thoughts on that are, one, the intersection is operating at an F. It's not going to get any better or worse. We've heard that time and time again. Um, two, Cummings is a sophisticated property owner. A and three, I believe we heard from Cummings uh, last meeting that they don't anticipate the, the, this project impacting their parking whatsoever. There's a, an excess of parking on their um, property. And, and lastly, there's going to be a study commissioned, and I think we should make that a, a condition of approval six months after the completion of construction. So if there are issues, um, there's going to be an opportunity to see them in real time and address them. So my, my personal feel, feeling, you're asking, you know, what the pleasure of the board is. You know, my thought is that it's appropriate to act on this now. And, and if the applicant and Cummings have a difference of opinion with respect to the city solicitor's um, legal opinion and access, that's not really for us to decide. I'm not even talking about that. So I'm just saying that this this may regardless of whether we approve it tonight, it may not be the end of the story, I guess, in a practical matter. Um, so my point is, uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I'm comfortable proceeding on the site plan uh, review application and voting on it tonight. Uh, just to follow up on the comment that you just made in terms of the, um, the post-construction um, study and the traffic evaluation, um, my one um, flag would be uh, whether or not the Cummings, um, uh, not just the issues of um, entering, exiting with traffic and things like that, but um, maybe a, a, a more extensive, not a full traffic study of flow within um, the, the property itself, um, but taking into um, uh, taking to point the concerns maybe that they have ahead of time um, as part of the study that uh, their concerns be evaluated as, uh, as part of um, the post-construction analysis? All right, it seems to be the consensus to close the public hearing. So I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Ms. Flannery, discussion on the motion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing is closed. Can we do this in five minutes? Yeah, I'm going to, yeah. Okay. 
So I guess I'd like to start the process of uh, a motion with respect to site plan review application 142-10. Uh, my motion would be to approve that site plan review. Uh, applicant calling to construct a police station on the two acre parcel at 175 Elliott Street. Uh, the motion that I'm proposing would have a number of conditions First, the general conditions uh, condition that work shall conform to the plan submitted with this application and, the revi and revised through 8-12-19 unless uh, revised plans are otherwise presented. Uh, condition number two, no substantial corrections, field modifications, additions, substitutions, alterations, or other changes shall be made in any plans, proposals, or supporting documents approved and endorsed by the Planning Board without the written approval of the Planning Board, which in its sole discretion may determine sub-substantiality. Any request for substantial modifications shall be made to the Planning Board for review and approval and shall include a description of the proposed modification, reasons the modification is necessary, and supporting documentation. Condition three. Uh, compliance with the conditions set forth in the 10119 Parking and Traffic Commission letter from Richard Benevento, specifically that the project proponent will conduct a post development analysis within six months, looking six months of the completion of construction. And this is what is following occupancy. Sure, yeah. Six they, the issuance of the occupancy permit, I think we'll do. Um, the proponent will conduct a post-development analysis of traffic impact within six months following the issuance of an occupancy permit. At six months? Okay. Um, so the, I'm going to revise that then. The proponent will conduct a post-development analysis of traffic impact following the issuance of an occupancy permit at six months following the issuance of the occupancy permit. The analysis shall be consist consistent with the scope of the current traffic impact and access evaluation submitted as part of the site plan review to inform potential traffic signal adjustments in order to optimize signal timing. Signals shall be optimized so that traffic operation does not degrade to an unacceptable level of service or in cases that are already operating at a level of service E or worse shall be same or improved over existing conditions. Um, and to address Derek's uh, uh, concern, the coming center shall be afforded an opportunity to provide input um, with that post-development analysis. Uh, additionally, part from parking and traffic, signage shall be installed at the unsignalized driveway located near the east property boundary consistent with MUTCD standards, indicating that the access drive is for emergency vehicles and right turn in slash out only. And again, these conditions are uh, memorialized in the 10-119 letter of the Park and Traffic Commission. Number four, compliance with any and all conditions set forth by the Board of Health in a letter from Bill Burke dated 9-3-19, incorporated herein. And attached here too, compliance number five, compliance with any and all conditions and assurances set forth by the city engineer in a letter from Eric Barber dated 91019, incorporated herein and attached here too. Number six, as built plans stamped by a registered professional engineer shall be submitted to the planning department and department of public services prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. The as built plans shall also be submitted to the city engineer in electronic file format suitable for the city's use and approved by the city engineer prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Okay. That, in a nutshell, is my motion. Okay, well, seconded by William. Discussion on the motion? Wayne? 
just wonder if we should add uh, six and 12 months for, um, for uh, post-development analysis. Any thoughts on that? Six months is quick, and it's after the uh, occupancy permit, so things may not be up and running particularly uh, robustly. I'll tell you why I stuck with just six months is because um, given the nature of the project, I think things will be up and running quickly. The police station, um, my guess is that they're going to occupy and get operating quickly. So I thought that um, just one uh, kind of look back study would be sufficient. Um, and that's why I chose six months for the motion. Okay. For the discussion on the motion. Okay, all in favor? All opposed? Yes. Yes. Motion passes. Our next agenda item is the continued public hearing site plan review number 140-19, special permit 172-19, and inclusionary housing permit number 17-19. Depot 2, a mixed commercial and residential building, 134, 142, 146 Rantoul Street, and 1-9 Park Street. The applicant is Depot Square Phase 2 LLC. Uh, good evening, members of the planning board. Miranda Gooding from Glovsky and Glovsky on behalf of the applicant and the team um, is here again this evening. Chris Copeland from Beverly Crossing, Thad Samasco and Krista Broyles from SV Design. And there's also a, a new attorney from Glovsky and Glovsky, Connor Walsh, also uh, appearing this evening. Um, as discussed at the last public hearing on September 10th, we are uh, prepared this evening to discuss two main topics. Um, the first is the project's compliance with the tall building guidelines as requested by the board. Um, and the second is a review of the special permit criteria for the project. Um, I, I wanna say that, um, forgive me in advance, I'm gonna talk as quickly as I can because there is a lot of information to get through on this project, which is a big one. Um, and there's a lot of information to present on both topics. Um, we're going to do our best to conclude within about 45 to 50 minutes so that there is ample time for the board to uh, share some of your thoughts and concerns and questions about this project as we have not had an opportunity to hear from the board and we really could use some of that guidance going forward at this point. Um, so, on the tall building guidelines, um, tonight's presentation is essentially the same that was given previously to the design review board. Um, and which culminated in last month's straw poll revealing that a majority of the members agree that the design is consistent with the general intent of the city's design guidelines for tall buildings, at least preliminarily. Um, a word about the guidelines. They are contained, as members now know, I presume, within a 48-page rather dense document 
that has shown itself to be susceptible of very different interpretations depending on the viewpoint of any individual reader. Regardless of one's viewpoint, I think we can all concede that the guide guidelines are not perfect. Some of them conflict with one another in application, as you will see tonight, and some of them haven't worked particularly well in the projects that they have been applied to. Fortunately, our ordinance only requires consistency with the guidelines and not strict adherence to them. With all that said, they are the governing document for this project, and the applicant has worked very hard to navigate by them in designing the project. As outlined in this slide, the stated goal of the guidelines is to harmonize new construction with the existing urban context and to minimize the impact of tall buildings' heights on its surroundings. This goal signals and affirms that the guidelines are intended to apply to the analysis of new construction. They were never intended to be a blueprint for how or whether to preserve existing structures. The guidelines then go on to address the various categories of design elements enumerated on this slide, including street walls, side rear walls, maximum site area to height limit, corner buildings, gateways, civic centers and open spaces, landmarks and view corridors. We have produced a list of conditions uh, which uh, pertaining to the various categories of these design elements and um, Connor's going to provide the board with copies of our list which was previously uh, uh, provided to the design, uh, design review board. In summary, and, and Thad's going to go through this in more detail obviously, but in summary of the 27 guidelines pertaining to those elements that we just reviewed, six of the guidelines are not strictly adhered to in the project design. But there is either substantial compliance or a reasoned explanation for the non-compliance. The document also contains about 25 additional urban design guidelines, more generalized guidelines, and we meet all of those with the exception of one. With this backdrop and with the benefit of Thad's presentation, we hope that you will conclude at the as the evening draws to an end that Beverly Crossing has more than met its burden of demonstrating a design that is consistent with the intent of the guidelines. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody. I'll try to go quickly through uh, the guidelines, um, in focusing on the six that are not strictly adhered to, but also going through them in general. And uh, that's, the guidelines have, some of, it, some of them have a quantitative part, which is the building can be so tall and needs a setback of so much. Those are fairly easy. And then there's a section of it that relates to it more to context. I'm going to try to walk you through how we view the context, and then and we'll go from there. However, the major parts of the guidelines that we, that we have met that fall into that whole category of, of ones that we have met, of the, uh, they ask for a continuous line of buildings along both sides of the street. We feel they really are referring to Rantoul Street here, and we have done that. It says larger, taller buildings belong on Rantoul Street and, I, and are, are ideally suited, situated on the lower elevations of Rantoul Street, which is the side of the street, of course, that we're on. That's the lower side. They ask that we match the primary cornice height, which I'll explain a little later. Uh, they talk about the maximum floor area of the top floor being 50% of the total site. Uh, we are at 48%. They ask us to, uh, they encourage roof terraces, which we have incorporated. They mention having a primarily masonry exterior, which we have. And they talk about cladding the top floors with a contrasting material and color, which we in fact have done. And they also state that the tall rear wall heights, when they don't abut a residential district, and we don't believe we do abut a residential district, are okay. And that's what we have done. We've pushed the mass toward the back rear corner of the site. And then there's a cross section on page 21 of the guidelines. That it's pretty much exactly what we're doing. It shows the park, and it shows the taller corner, and it shows the, uh, an edge, and it suggests having a room for pedestrian cafes and, and, and a wider sidewalk. It's also pretty clear that parking should be kept out of view to the extent possible and off the front of the building and you should avoid having vehicles cr crossing the major pedestrian routes which we really meet, read that to be Rantoul and railroad in this case is the major pedestrian routes. It's not to say the others aren't 
used, but those are the two major ones. Here are the six that are not met, and I'll go through these one by one. The first is this 45-foot cornice height to match the adjacent. Our cornice height is 47 feet. We're on the far right here. We have a 47-foot cornice height. Uh, when the a pedestrian activated ground use guidelines came, they asked for 12-foot floor to floor, which sort of automatically made the building a little taller. The 47 feet we have matches the 47 feet of, deep, of the Depot Square One building, and is a little bit lower than the 50-foot uh, cornice height uh, that was used at the Holmes building. I also note that we are eight and a half feet of elevation lower than we are at the gateway. The, our building, the, the road actually drops down. So the apparent height of this thing, it, it, is a, it feels like it's a little bit lower, but in any event, we are matching those cornice heights, which happens to give you 47 feet, not 45. This is a view as, you, as you're heading north on Rantoul. Uh, you can kind of see the, the dip in the road. And if you look you know, fairly closely, you can see the 45-foot cornice line running down through some of the new buildings, but also some of the mill buildings on either side of the street, a pretty effective line uh, as it runs down. And that's, we're kind of following that line. And you can really see here pretty dramatically the dip in the road. Um, the second guideline that we're not fully conforming with is this idea. This is looking south on Rantoul Street. Uh, as you go up to the 47 feet, I guess I'm dead here. Um, maybe I'm not dead there. Uh, you go 47 feet. The guidelines suggest going in five, uh, 10 feet and then up. Uh, what we found, and, and, and I think Bill Finch mentioned this at the last meeting, that having a step here makes it seem, the building seem less top heavy. Planning department encouraged us to put that step in and we have done that. On the Holmes building, you can see here the two stories straight up and, and they had added the five foot projection in some small areas. You can imagine if that ran continuously, it would have that top floor feel more integrated into the building. And I will note here the change of material from the masonry to that lighter color which is what we're doing the same way. So the building tends to, to blend a little bit more in the sky and, and be a little less of a mass, apparent mass. The third uh, guideline that we're uh, not completely conforming to is this idea that on the prominent corner, which is Rantoul Street, they, they suggest that the, the width of the prominent corner should be 25% of the width of the building. We're at 31.25%. That's simply a function of wanting the facade of this building to be proportioned well. To have it be the 25% means that the, we feel that the building is too narrow on that corner. So we took that extra, it's about 10 extra feet of width on our corner to have the building we felt to, frankly look better. The fourth one talks about setting the corner elements back somewhere between four and 10 feet. We've set, it back, we've set it back an additional 10 feet uh, to be 20 feet back. This is so that it encourages pedestrian access to this plaza we've had for accessibility and to create a really great people place. By being a little further back, and we are talking about 10 feet, it's less distance from, from me to, to the wall, that's probably 12, 15 feet. Just a little bit more, it just gives the post office a little more elbow room so we're not bearing quite down on it. And then we're following what the post office did, which is it's set back off the street, but it strongly faces the park and has a series of steps that, that go down to the sidewalk. And we're pretty much following that exact format. And in fact, we have a strong facade element that faces the park directly, similar to what the post office does and what's happening at the depot. So we are on the park. It's a, it's a unique site here that we are on the park. We recognize that. And we have that corner facing strongly on the park as one heads uh, south on Rantoul Street, that's a very prominent corner that you will see marking that corner, we think, very strongly. This idea of a consistent street edge along the park, um, we understand we have a good, strong street edge on Rantoul, but we think that the street edge along the park is a bit of a unique situation. We could very easily have put the five-story building right on the park and had a massive wall, but we felt that it works much better as a people's space to have a little bit of relief on that corner to create this plaza. Our building does create a very strong street wall right at the corner by the depot, corner of railroad and Park Street, but it 
gives some relief as it comes forward and makes, the, it makes that plaza. Uh, so that we think that with, that with multiple connections to the public sidewalk from, the, from this plaza, we really meet the intent of this rather unique place for the street edge. It's still an edge, it's just a different kind of edge. It's still defined. It just has a bit of a, of a nuance to it where it goes from building to plaza to series of steps. I will point out the current condition at, with the uh, Casa de Luca and the press blocks has one corner at the at one entry at the corner of Rantoul and Railroad that's not accessible, that would have to somehow finagle to get access to, and then a very blank, inaccessible wall for a good 50 feet or so until we get to a big opening and then the press box start, which is with its two entrance. I don't view that as a very good street edge, to be, to be honest. What's there now, I think our street edge is much more compelling and much more interesting and much more pedestrian friendly. A little diversion, this is a, a view of the courtyard. Let's see if I can walk you through it. First of all, we counted the benches in Veterans Park. There are seven. We happen to have seven benches on our plaza located throughout. And this part of the plaza from the, this is Rantoul Street along the, the left here. This plaza is fully access, accessible to the public. It's not a pay for play. You can walk right on it. It's actually a little bit, made a little bit wider. For, so it invites interaction, invites dog walking, and all that kind of thing. There are benches along here facing the walkway. There are some seating areas here and here that are public. There's a series of steps that goes down to the sidewalk off the plaza to create this porosity. We hope folks will kind of cut through and around the corner. There are places for public art, which are shown by these stars. All in, and, it, and there's some good-sized tree plant in, in planters along the way. If uh, this is set up for an outdoor dining for a tenant, but if an outdoor, if a tenant doesn't need that space, the plaza would simply expand into this area, creating a little, even a little more room. We, we were strategic in the size of this walkway. We wanted it to be wide enough to feel comfortable that folks could sit on the bench and not have somebody walk so close to their knees, it's uncomfortable, but also not so wide that it feels like it's, it's in a way, it's a big wide open uh, desert. So I think we have the balance right. This is the current condition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, where you have the press box with a couple entrances, a very big space here, hard to tell, that's wide open, the big blank old kitchen wall of Casa de Luca, and then an inaccessible wall along this way with windows up around my head height. We think that our street edge is much more uh, interesting and compelling than this one. Uh, this was uh, Depot Matters' uh, presentation, suggesting that we have a wall along our sp between our sidewalk and our courtyard that is as tall as this gentleman, who I think is m kind of my height. Um, the reality is that the, the um, in the worst case scenario, this Portland gentleman here, uh, follically challenged as well, this is the high point. I've actually reverse imaged this slide. When you are at the corner of Park, and railroad, the building, the first floor is that high. And then it goes, as the building, the road goes up, by the time you get to the, to the stairway, the first set of stairs, it's from here to about here high. When you first start out, it's about as high as the table relative to me. It is not a big wall along that, along that, along that entire, entire that plane. In our defense on this particular, um, building, we had cut an 18-inch trough in here and irrigated it to plant ivy. We had hoped to have a green wall. When they redid Rantoul Street, they covered up our irrigation and our ivy. But this was to be a nice, tall, green, sort of Wrigley Park wall, as intended originally. So this is, our, this is what, we, what our, the scene as we see it, an accessible plaza that one can get on easily. and and access to the to the ten, to the uh, own, um, the tenant spaces, the retail spaces, the restaurants, as well as access to the um, apartment units that are above. It starts out up high as when when the sidewalk, the public sidewalk, is closer, with a series of wide open steps, and ends at the end with a building wall that's right on the right on the property line. But it's perforated. We have that outdoor uh, and covered terrace that I had explained in an earlier presentation. 
The sixth and final uh, guideline that we're not strictly conforming to is the treatment of the landmark building. And the guidelines say that you should take the, the post office, multiply it by one and a half, and the height of the building should be not, a building within a block of that should not be higher than that one and a half times, which is in this case 63 feet. It does say, however, that you, that excludes the prominent corner, suggesting the prominent corner could be as high as 75 feet, and then behind it, which seems counterintuitive, you, ha you would have to be lower. It seems to us it would be that you would want the building to be a little bit lower at the post office and then a little bit higher, which is what we've done. So we are 64 feet at the corner, and our height is pushed back, our 72 or 73 foot height is pushed back off the corner. So that shows up in this plan, a little hard to see. The black, thin black outline is the sixth floor, and I think it's 215 feet from the post office to our first corner, and something like 264, 265 feet from, to that back prominent corner. It's Depot, uh, the 131 building is, is much, much closer. It does not seem to affect the post office at all. We're diagonally across the street. We, we, see, we, we feel that there's zero impact of this building on the post office, which was in fact the intent, as, as we would read the guidelines, not to impact that building negatively or not to take away any sight line to it. If anything, by pulling back, we've improved the sight lines of the building from the plaza. Uh, this slide is down lower on, on railroad, nearer the depot. The red outline that we're showing here is what the tall building guidelines would allow, which is a five foot setback, up 10 over five and up 10. We are in fact much further back. We cut back much further so that one is, one is on the sidewalk across from the park, say at the farmer's market, they cannot see the fifth and sixth floor. They'd have to be across the other side of the park or in the middle of the park to see it from that perspective. So I think that's kind of the tall building guidelines in terms of the, uh, the quantitative things that you can, you can really sort of measure. Uh, and then in terms of the context, you know, for our, for our, for our perspective, the context is about, and we've highlighted the, the roofs of these buildings, it's about larger buildings, some new, some old, all working together, and we wanted to put a, you know, we have a larger building that seems to fit in that context. Further back, going between Rantoul and Cabot Street, yeah, there's a series of historic houses, but that first row is a row of larger mill buildings and or new buildings that have been built, and we feel like we're working with that context. And then, yes, we get to the park, and that's why we turn the C-shape toward the park to take the edge off of having a wall against the park. But we do look, we, you know, these, this is the example of the kind of buildings we were looking at. I think you've seen this slide before. And some of the details that we're, that we're looking at as we, as we develop our masonry from the buildings around and in the neighborhood. And honestly, from the park, you can't see our building. This is, a, this is from Broadway, looking across. You can see a little bit of the yellow of Casa de Luca uh, in, the, in the very distance. And then quickly we talk, talk about, it was suggested that the whole design of this building was based on how cheap it would be to build this kind of parking garage. Uh, it's actually sort of the opposite. What, the design imperative we were working, work, working with was locate the parking out of view and off the front of the building and avoid ve vehicles crossing major pedestrian routes. So knowing that we, it made no sense to come in off of rear road or Rantoul, and, and knowing that we had this slope of 13 and a half feet from one corner to the other, and some intermediate points at like nine and a half feet as you see on the slide, it seemed to us the best place to enter this building and to hide the parking was off of Park Street. That way when one is coming home, they can come from both in town and out of town, or leaving, they can go out of town or in town and have all those choices. If we picked Pleasant Street, you'd have to go, all, everybody would have to go home by way of Rantoul and out by way of Lower Pleasant and Park we thought that the Park Street gave a lot more options and, and eased the flow. Uh, as everyone probably knows, the guideline, the city zoning is very strict on parking aisles, parking size, the parking aisle width. 
and all, and all those kinds of things. The geometry of this thing was absolutely perfect for this kind of donut circulation with double loaded parking. Left room for a bike room. I think there's at least room for 60 bikes plus room to hang bikes in front of cars. There's room for the trash. We, we actually used part of this opportunity to come out here, roll level with grade, to, to have our residential trash come out and have our move-in day kind of activities there so that keeps the traffic off of the busier streets. But coming, in at, coming home at night, you're coming in and out of that one single door, which again, the guidelines suggest the fewer amount of crossings possible uh, is what you should try to achieve. When it came to thinking about the upper levels of the building, by the way, you don't just do the one, you don't build this from the bottom up. You, you go from the bottom up and the top down and around the outside and come back again and come back again. I'm, I'm building it from the bottom up, but the design isn't just driven by the parking, it's driven by all the aesthetic considerations and the context considerations that I'm suggesting here. It just so happened that that was the most efficient way to do the parking, that they got the parking out of view. The C shape we came upon, it gives a lot of access to light to the units. And we, you know, the question is, which way should the open courtyard face? It seemed obvious to us it should face the park rather than having a wall on the park. And so that is what we did. And then we cut, we cut one of the leg of the C back, that extra 10 feet I suggested, so that we could have more access to this plaza and have folks basically connect across and extend the park effectively between, uh, from our building. Upper floors, pretty much, the, you know, the line of apartments. The, the red highlighted areas are changes that have been made to the building from the initial submission, where you can see most of, a, a fair bit of effort has been taken to take the mass of the building off the park, particularly on the sixth floor, where it's been pulled back. And again, mostly trying to push it back to the corner of Park and, uh, and Pleasant Streets. Here you can see we were at 65%, I think, floor area, we're down to the 48% below the 50, as I mentioned earlier. And then quickly for the exterior, for us, these are the pressing guidelines that they recognize these are gonna be larger scale buildings. They shouldn't look like, they shouldn't replicate directly historic buildings, that they should be masonry with smaller parts, articulated with other materials, which we've done, that the top four should be contrasting materials and don't do this big glass building. And then again, don't make it look older than it is or make it, not make it a copy. And we're not, we have not copied a style. We are, we're, we're using and incorporating references to history, but this, is, this will look and be clearly a new building. And I think you've seen this before. I would only point out, I think it was suggested that we don't have enough right in our storefronts, but we do have changed the glazing system from one side to both color and extend from one side to the other. We do have a continuous cornice line. Uh, we do change the color of that and the materials of that, but it's a continuous cornice line as suggested by the, by the guidelines. There is this section in the, uh, in the zoning regarding activated ground floor use, a relatively new section. It has seven points. We have met all seven of these points. And we did, we did and are charmed by the post office. Uh, we did look at that, as I mentioned earlier, and thinking about the cast stone and the porch on our railroad street, our railroad avenue rather elevation, which you see here. The, por the porch portico is, is the, on the first floor of the bottom left here. We have the five-story element. It, it was six when we first submitted it. It's been, we've knocked it down a floor. The right leg of the building down on railroad and uh, Park Street is now is still four stories, but we've clipped and cut back those fifth and sixth floors. As I showed you earlier, those are set fairly far back so that you would not see them when you're on the roadway uh, across the street from, the, from this building. I should point out, I think it was suggested in one of the meetings, I think it's a good idea that maybe we should add some access to from the corner of, of railroad and park, which we've done where, that, where the blue arrow is. So that, folks, so that makes that much more approachable. So it's yet another way to, to, to access this building uh, besides all of the other ones that I've mentioned. And I know when you, when you look at an elevation like this, it looks like a big block. And we have done this, we have done this slide here to show how many feet from the property line these various elements are. 
So the building on the part on the right is on the property line, but the center section's back 85 feet, and the left and the left section's back 37, and, and then the prominent tower comes forward to the 20. There's a lot of movement in this building. It is not this. It is not this block. In other words, it is not that. It is that. There's a big difference between those two images. To suggest that the scale of the building is that and the scale of the building is not that is, is not correct. That's the building we're presenting. We think it does a great job on the park. We think it does a nice job containing the street line of Railroad Avenue. And yes, this is, this is uh, Park Street. Uh, this has developed quite a bit since we first presented it. We've added more brick. We've set back the fifth and sixth floors more. We have now added that corner entrance on the far left to, to engage the sidewalk more. We've added some additional uh, public art panels to it. Ultimately, though, you have, to get in, uh, you have to get in and out of this building by automobile. You have to get the trash out of it. You have to have a generator that needs to breathe. There's so many, there's, there's so many things you know, that we have to provide in a building. There's only so many places to put them. We think we've done a nice job. This is not just ugly old concrete. We'll do a very nice rubbed concrete with proper score lines that work with the building. This is our suggestion of what we would do. When you're on the, when you're on the train, you're up at that yellow line that you see coming across. That's sort of the height of the platform. And there are some trees in the foreground that help take a little bit of the edge off. We are on, we are on the property line. There's not a lot of room for street trees and so forth on that lawn. And the slide on the right is, this is a photograph of when you get off the train, you're on that crosswalk and looking to the right. And again, the white uh, press box is the extent of the brick that we have used here on the right, on the left on this slide. The rest of our building is occurring between that and that depot square building that you see on the far, far right. And last Pleasant Street, we've, as I think was mentioned, we added brick to the far left so that when one is leaving Court Street, they have a brick elevation that, used, that was not brick before. So again, we have a substantially masonry building. We've changed up the materials. We've kept the, third, the fifth and sixth floor, this sort of ethereal gray to help blend into the sky a little bit better. And I think you've seen this slide before. We are going to develop a, and are developing a good set of details, strong details, so that you don't just see this building from 500 feet and, and appreciate it. As you get closer and closer, you get to see and appreciate more and more details as it comes to life. And that's one of the, the DRB's suggestions was, can you give us a few more details when you come back so we can, we can ensure that those windows are, in fact, set back far enough, that, that the soldier coursing is a little bit proud of the rest of the brick, and we plan on doing that. So that's, there it is. When you get down to the ground, we think it's quite active. The uh, space on the far left has the glass going down to the floor and all the way out to the street. Space on the right is set back to allow accessibility, but also just add a little more interest. Different glazing color, and that, that kind of thing is happening. There's some planters in there as well. And then the sun, I think we mentioned before, other than the solstice, but frankly probably is, uh, with, a, with the current buildings would probably be in the shade. I think on the solstice at 3 p.m. at that bottom left, is the only time there's any real shadow being put upon the park by the project. You're about an hour from darkness, I think, at that point. And then last, um, from the depot matter suggested that the urban fabric is not defined by these newest buildings and have taken our very dramatic photographs by our professional photographers who come out for our awards presentations and shown these buildings dramatically. But these buildings live on the street. It's not about looking at these dramatic corners. These are really great for our PR, but they're not really how it works in real life. The fabric we found, for example, at the Burnham building was a little bit torn and frayed. It was an abandoned infinity dealership. So we created a place for 35, I think, people, families to live. It's a nice building to walk by. It has some nice and pleasant entrances. It finishes the street. It creates a street edge. The Enterprise building we found at a, at a used car lot and an a, a Enterprise car rental place. 
And we put this in, a nice little coffee shop. I wish we had the green wall, uh, but it's a, it's a good street edge. I think there's 45 families that get to live here. Flats at 131, we found a nondescript brick building with a really badly done uh, ground level facade, two empty parking lots, and put that there. It's very active, two restaurants, the, the, the cooking place, seems like a much better use. 72 families get to live here. Friendlies was, a, as we all know, was this empty lot, a little bit of a weed field. You need to walk on the sidewalk. This is going to be an ice cream shop very soon. Imagine the, imagine the folks out there with the tables and chairs walking down here. As you walk down the sidewalk, it's, it's actually quite pleasant. And as the, as the street trees grow, it'll be even more pleasant. So for us, the fabric we found was a little bit torn, a little bit tattered. Sometimes it was missing. And we put it back together. We're proud of the work we've done. And, and this building, I think, has been worked on. The one we're talking about tonight has been worked on harder and harder than any of the others, and we suspect it will be pretty successful. The Ford project, the car, empty car lot, the, or the used car lot, and the, and the old dealership. Uh, we suggest when the Japanese noodle company comes in, and the coffee shop comes in, and we finish this whole thing off, we're going to have a very successful street, uh, street experience on this building. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Miranda to talk about the special permit. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Thad. Um, as members of the board know, there are two special permits required for the current design. One to allow the building to have a height of approximately 73 feet, and the other is a special permit to allow a parking requirement of one space for all of the two bedroom units that are located in the project. Um, I'm gonna walk you through the special, uh, the special permit criteria with a warning that the first one, um, which is, is really the most significant one, and I'm gonna spend more time on that than the others, so don't worry that it's gonna go on forever. Um, but the first, the first criteria, criteria is this, that the specific site is an appropriate location for the proposed use, and that the character of adjoining uses will not be adversely affected. And if I were to wager, I would expect that this is the one that members will get hung up on the most. Um, this criteria really has two parts. One is that the site is at an appropriate location for the use, and, and then there's a second part, which does the proposed project adversely affect adjoining uses. So starting with the first piece, the appropriate location. We think the site is an excellent location for the proposed development. It's immediately adjacent to Beverly Depot and is located in various zoning overlays established to promote tall buildings with reduced parking requirements next to transit stations. It comes on the heels of more than 10 years of concentrated planning effort to encourage TOD of development in the vicinity of the Beverly Depot MBTA station. And as you can see in this slide, it began in 2007 with a zoning amendment approved by this board as well as the city council authorizing the tall building overlay district, the special permit that we're here for tonight. In 2010, Beverly Main Streets did a downtown 2020 study, and folks will remember the rooftops before retail. We need to encourage residential development on Rantoul Street to support, ultimately, retail and, and a stronger commercial base on Rantoul Street. In 2011, the city council and, again, the planning board both approved a zoning amendment to, the, to establish the CC Parking Overlay District to approve reduced parking requirements, again, in recognition of the benefits of transit-oriented development and trying to discourage uh, residents from having more cars than they actually need. In 2012, uh, the City Council passed a residential TIF program. It hasn't been used, but it was passed for this location uh, on Rantoul Street, again, to encourage residential development of high densities. 
In 2016, a zoning amendment passed by this board and the city council, allowing parking amendments to, again, I guess, loosen up some of the standards for parking and, and encouraging shared parking and parking within frontage for commercial uses in the CC district. And then most uh, recently in 2017, the zoning amendment, again, passed by this board and city council that eliminated the special permit requirement for mixed use buildings like this one located in the core pedestrian area with activated ground floor uses. And I would say that housing in general um, is certainly in keeping with the city's community housing plan from 2017, not to mention Governor Baker's well-publicized call for new housing throughout the Commonwealth. Not surprisingly, the city's housing plan includes recommendations for additional housing development near commercial areas and public transportation. The demand for this type of housing, particularly for seniors and for smaller households, is real and it's persistent. In fact, I'd like to take this opportunity to correct information that was previously asserted during the public comment period, specifically regarding the vacancy rates at Beverly Crossing projects. And, and even more specifically, the newest project at Linked 480. Uh, a member of the public commented that the project had not been leased after some time. In fact, throughout the Beverly Crossing portfolio, the total occupancy rate is 98.1%. The property at 480 Rantoul Street, the most recent one to come online, has been fully leased up since April of this year. And you should know that the turnover rate for these buildings is extremely low only 37% compared to an industry average of 55%. All of this probably reflects the fact that over 28% of the residents of these apartments come from Beverly originally, and another 32% are coming from the adjacent North Shore area. That's the, the slide that depicts some of those percentages. For many of these residents, Beverly is their community, and they want to be here. And um, despite you know, several comments that I've heard, and I suspect that others on the board have heard them as this project has been in the public domain, um, there, I've frequently heard that, these com that folks uh, worry that these apartments are filling up with transients, that Beverly is gonna become another Lynn, nothing against Lynn. Um, these numbers tell a very different story. Again, there is a need. There is a need among Beverly residents as well as folks across the North Shore. So in conclusion, I would say that there are ample grounds for determining that this site is appropriate for the use and that there is a very real demand for the use in the city. Um, excuse me. I flipped ahead here too fast. So the next leg of that first criteria is that the character of adjoining uses will not be adversely affected. And as I hope members appreciated from some of the before and after shots in Thad's presentation, the TOD development along Rantoul Street has really been centered on redeveloping parcels that had previously been underutilized economically, in most cases for at least a couple of decades, stretching back to when United Shoe closed and shopping malls really robbed Main Streets of some of the, the vital businesses that, that folks like Councillor Trubateris remember um, and have spoken about eloquently during these meetings. The pictures tell the story of new development, strengthening the tax base in the community and ensuring that Rand's Tool Street once again, once again becomes the commercial center that longtime residents fondly remember and want to see continued for themselves and for a new generation of residents. As a result, I'd submit that if you drive down Rantoul Street today, you'll notice that the underutilized parcels, the so-called missing teeth along the Rantoul Street CC district, have really largely been filled in. Or if they, if they haven't been redone, they're in the process of being redone. There's new investment, not just with big projects, but also with smaller building improvement projects for existing businesses. 
And this trend of improvement is positively impacting property values, as well as bringing new residents to support existing and new businesses up and down the commercial corridors on both Rantoul Street and Cabot Street, and encouraging a wider diversity of business, businesses and services for those of us who already live downtown. The proposed project will similarly help support this continued growth and revitalization, positively impacting adjoining uses in the district. But what about impacts on other uses in the National, Regi in the National Register District? One of the products of these approvals and the redesign process that this building has gone through is that I think most of us can agree that the current building and its materials are now more compatible with the style and aesthetic of one of the more prominent bu buildings in the district, the post office. And that alluded to this in his presentation. The design has also been carefully developed to reduce negative impacts on Odell, on Odell Park by keeping most of the mass at the back of the building. And we also believe that building a stronger economic base in the National Register District will ultimately encourage more reinvestment in the remaining historic structures in the district, like the Beverly Depot building itself, or the Van Ness Creative Building, or for that matter, the post office, which now has had new life breathed into it by the close proximity of so many new residents, arguably contributing to the $1 million renovation that it's undergoing currently instead of being sold off at surplus like so many other post offices around the country. We contend that this is not an accident and that it is evidence that the project will have a positive impact on the adjoining uses and properties in this district, even though, yes, it results in the loss of the Casa de Luca building. I'm gonna use this opportunity also to set the record straight on another uh, earlier statement during the public hearing which has a bearing on this last point. And um, Connor's gonna provide members of the board with a copy of the full text of an email that was alluded to by Matt Pujo. The email is authored by Thad Samasco in 2008. In response to an email inquiry from Mr. Pujo about his opinion relative to the MBTA parking garage, which was then proposed for the same site. And this email um, we would contend was was quoted wildly out of context during the public meeting. While we pass out the entire letter for the board's benefit, I'd like to read a portion of it in response, and, and this is in response to Mr. Pujo asking directly whether Thad thought the press box should be demolished to make way for the MBTA garage. And the response is this, and it, and it plays just as well today, honestly. Um, a significant part of an architect's job is to balance the focused passion each stakeholder brings to a project given the limits of budget, time, and the public interest in a way that makes the most of the opportunity. While the railroad hotels certainly have a distinct character and speak in an interesting way about being a different era, I do not think that their preservation outweighs the public good generated by a much needed, well-located, in this case, parking garage serving mass transportation users. I think that a case can be made that the economic benefit provided by this project will spur the preservation of historic buildings in the area to a much greater degree than if it didn't happen. Perhaps if Beverly's history were solely related to the railroad, like some Midwestern, Midwestern towns were, I'd feel differently, but certainly the ocean and river were the geographical drivers of Beverly's development. The railroad was important, but not that important. So I'd reluctantly, but definitely, want to see the project go forward and the hotels removed. These remarks carry weight here as well. Um, and uh, in conclusion, I would say that there is strong evidence to support a finding that the proposed mixed-use project will continue to improve the character of adjoining uses in the district and not detract from them, therefore satisfying the first special permit criteria. Uh, the second criteria outlined in the zoning ordinance is that no factual evidence is found that property values in the district will be adversely affected by such use. And to uh, demonstrate this item, we have compiled the assessed values of properties surrounding 131 Rantoul Street and 480 Rantoul Street two current Beverly Crossing projects, um, 
that information is being handed out now. This slide summarizes the findings with respect to their um, comparative property values. For flats at 131 Rantoul Street, assessed values of those adjacent properties experienced a 162% average increase from 2016 to 2019, uh, ranging in individual cases from a 111% to 200% for individual properties. And there were about seven properties in the mix. Um, for Link 480, uh, in that case, the average increase was 124% from 2017 to 2019, ranging again from 114% to 131%. Moving on to special permit criteria number three, that no undue traffic and no nuisance or unreasonable hazard will result. So first, we would like to note that Parking and Traffic Commission has uh, considered this project on multiple meetings. And as noted earlier, they have uh, voted to recommend approval of the application after hearing from the applicant's consultant, GPI. To the extent that the board wants to hear the traffic analysis in more detail, that presentation can certainly be available at the next public hearing, and we will have our consultant present. Um, in the meantime, this slide highlights a few few key facts for your consideration. Uh, first of all, the rate of residents at Beverly Crossing's most recent project, 131 Rantoul Street, which the commission asked us to uh, survey for, for transit-oriented um, habits. Uh, that survey found that they are using public transportation or other means of transportation to work that actually, at rates that actually exceed the industry assumptions. Um, so 28% of Beverly Crossing residents uh, report using the commuter rail and another 5% walk, bike, carpool, or bus to work for a total of 32%, excuse me, 33% of, of the population that relies on uh, other means besides their car to get to work, which is exactly, um, which is exactly the goal of TOD development. Um, and as noted on the slide as well, Beverly Crossing is going to implement a variety of measures to encourage public transportation and discourage extra cars, or TDM measures. Um, and I, I will say that, uh, again, we are happy to rely on the P&T recommendation or present uh, this information anew at the board's pleasure, but we feel that there will be adequate uh, evidence to uh, meet this criteria. Number four, that adequate and appropriate facilities will be provided for the property operation and maintenance of the proposed use. This criterion really asks the board to consider whether the project includes appropriate facilities to support the use. In addition to information stated in the application already, here are some of the considerations in support of that finding. First, all applicable fire and safety codes will be observed in the construction of the project facilities, and there will be ample access for safe, public safety and emergency vehicles. Um, secondly, there will be a, a whole slate of uh, off-site improvements that will be undertaken at the request of parking and traffic and, and at the applicant's suggestion to improve adjacent sidewalks and pedestrian connections to and from the project. Uh, Beverly Depot and the park. Some of these are shown on this slide. This is a representative slide. There's actually, um, so you can tell here, um, the applicant is going to be improving um, connections at here and here fr from the project to the park, as well as uh, on Pleasant Street. And what you can't see on this slide is that there are a slate of improvements to uh, improve pedestrian actress access down this side of Pleasant Street all the way to River Street. And there's also another set of improvements that are, are being proposed from Broadway to the park and, and or across uh, Park Street. Um, and all of that will be reflected in the final parking and traffic recommendation, which um, I, I anticipate you will have shortly. Um, finally, I would just note that the underground parking garage provides safe, convenient on-site parking for residents in full compliance with the, with the depot parking overlay district zoning requirements at one space per unit. 
a formula which is designed to encourage alternative means of travel and discourage residents from owning multiple vehicles. Number five, that there are no valid objections from abutting property owners based on demonstrable fact. There have been specific objections raised by at least one abutting property owner at Depot Square, which is 116 Rantoul Street, asking that the applicant pay special care and attention to the garage door servicing the garage on Park Street, and specifically asking for a bump out at the Park Pleasant intersection, all of which have been incorporated into this design, as well as improvements with respect to lighting. Um, and I'm sure there are, there are others that I'm forgetting, but I think the, the team has made every effort to uh, specifically address um, valid objections from abutters. Um, the team is also committed to rebuilding the sidewalks on Railroad Avenue and Pleasant Street and Park Street in response to those comments. And finally, special permit criteria number six, that adequate and appropriate city services are or will be available for the proposed use. So the, benefit of, the benefits of TOD developments like this project is that they require very little in terms of additional city services. They are built downtown where utilities and roadway connections already exist and are designed to accommodate denser building already. And as each project comes online, there are invariably specific utility or street improvement upgrades that are improved in connection with each project as well as increased financial resources like building permit fees and water demand fees that go back toward continuing to maintain the infrastructure in this part of town. Another consideration that comes up in this criteria is the consideration of uh, the numbers of school-aged children in these buildings. And as shown on this population slide here, only a small percentage of residents have school-aged children. Out of 155 apartments and 220 residents spread out over three projects, there are not more than 14 kids of school age. And, and I should just note that for this data, school age, the kids were reported up to the age of 20. So I think there's probably some overcounting here. Um, but all in all, the, the rate of, the rate of uh, kids to uh, residents is about 7%. Seven, 7%. Um, in fact, the solid, dependable tax revenue generated by these projects goes a long way to ensuring that adequate services are provided, not just for the project, but for the city as a whole. You can see that the construction of this project alone, um, and, and these are numbers that are, are based on, uh, on revenues through stabilization of all the rents, will be about $920,000 with an additional $300,000 per year in recurring tax revenue. And as shown on the next slide, the tax revenues generated by Beverly Crossing buildings each year are estimated now to be about $1.57 million once this building is, is, once and if this building is constructed, going to the bottom line of the city based on projected values. And given that the relatively small demand for services generated by these fully sprinklered, secure buildings having few school-aged residents and newly installed utility infrastructure, the fact is these buildings are not sapping the city's resources and services. To the contrary, they are spinning off benefits to the city that far exceed the hard costs associated with the development. For these reasons, we urge the board to vote in favor of the special permit relief being requested and we would be happy to field any questions. Questions from members of the board? It's been a while. Um, for you, Miranda, um, and I know we're not doing parking and traffic really at this meeting, um, but just because I want to alert you to um, things that seemed apparent to me from the traffic aspect, and, and really traffic is um, my, my main concern on this project. Um, and and I'm a, I want to alert you to them be, because it may be that I'm, either that I'm reading the report wrong or that uh, things can be addressed be, before the 
meeting where we do address it. Um, one is, um, I th think that the, the uh, traffic study assumes that at the time uh, that current conditions were assessed, which I think was March of this year, uh, that the Holmes building was fully occupied and uh, so that the traffic generated by that building was already built into the current conditions. And I'm just, I'm not sure if that's factually correct or not. I would have to check um, to see whether, so, and, and we'll, we'll ask uh, Rebecca Brown to comment right, on Right, I understand this. you're not yep. prepared to respond today, but okay. just highlighting that as, as one issue. Okay. Um, and then my other concern, again, about assumptions in the traffic study um, has to do with, I, I think there's, I think there's an assumption about the number of trips generated from that block currently. Um, and that, that assumption seemed high and not really justified anywhere where I could see it, based on my understanding of what, what goes on in that block currently, which I think is really just the enterprise car rental and, and little else. But um, so those were my to traffic issues, and, I, and again, I just, I don't expect you to respond today, but just to highlight those for, for next time. Sure, thank you. Derek? Um, hi, <clears throat> thank you. These uh, didn't seem like 45 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever it was. <clears throat> okay. So I appreciate the clarity of, um, of both, um, both sides. So I have two, two quick questions. <clears throat> um, one on the, the first part of your, um, presentation this evening uh, just trying to get a handle on the you know existing urban fabric um, mm -hmm. and context and so I just had a question um, and I appreciated the slides that were shown on the Burnham the Enterprise the flats the friendlies the Fords uh, these uh, developments that were done so my question is were any of those um, National Register historic districts Um, my, I believe the answer is no. I'm just, I think 131 is actually located within the district, but is not, is, is maybe within the bounds of the district, but it was not um, certainly one of the, the pre-existing building was not called out in the uh, register description, if you will, or nomination. Okay, I'm just trying to get a mm -hmm. handle on the existing yeah. context. Um, and then the uh, second question I had uh, is on, uh, I think it's uh, special criteria number five um, in terms of objections from abutters. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's some very fair points made there, but my question is, uh, we all know that the city owns the park. And so when we hear residents um, who are therefore owners of the park, um, would you consider them to be, um, you know, comments that would fall into the abutter category or not? Um, my, my, I appreciate the comments and I, I appreciate the sentiment behind them. My belief is that from a legal standing perspective, um, that unless somebody can express a, a unique harm in the evaluation of those criteria, that they may not have standing to raise objection. Now, does that mean should we should the board consider the the comments that you've had? I, I certainly would suggest that you can um, consider the comments from the public with all of the spirit that they have been conveyed. Um, but I think there's probably a question which I have not researched. Um, as to whether those individuals would have legal standing to actually challenge a, a decision of the board. So they're, they're, they're somewhat different. They but, turn on different uh, inquiries to some extent. I don't want to get too technical. Um, I, I want to I say that they are raising a legitimate um, descriptor for themselves, but 
reserve my rights to, to challenge their standing um, in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate the a lot of clarity that came from the presentation tonight um, and I actually really appreciate the email that you shared because one of my questions was what the thought process around um, preserving or incorporating the current style parts of the buildings as you've heard um, people are attached to the history, it means something um, to the public and it means something to residents. And so had there been any uh, early thoughts, discussions um, around how to do that and what led the applicant to decide the best movement forward was to, to um, start from scratch? I, um, I will I will answer it and I, and I will um, Thad may have some additional commentary um, and I, I will say this we've said this in in other forum as well um, the applicant has looked at saving this building the applicant has looked at saving all of the buildings the applicant has many designs that have been considered um, there are a lot of sort of functional and practical reasons that go into that went into the determination to proceed with a new building instead of preserving some or all of the old buildings. Um, but I, I will tell you emphatically, we have looked at it. Um, I think for the reasons that Thad is going to describe, um, as well as sort of the philosophical leaning of the developer and sort of the approach and, and the belief in what we're doing here, um, the decision was to proceed with a new building and, and not restore. But I think that can put some, some better color on some of the practical considerations. Probably not. I, I, I think that we start by looking at the line of buildings that run from the gateway through and, want, and wanting to continue that line and turn in the corner. There are not a lot of small-scale wood frame Casa de Lucas sized buildings on that run. There was one on the corner of Pleasant and uh, Rantoul on, on the other side of the street. Actually, we, we had a hand in restoring that building. Um, so to us, to suddenly have this line of taller buildings break out into this small three-story wood frame building didn't, didn't quite make a lot of sense. And, and folks, that we spoke to, including us, you know, Sue at Historic Beverly said it, it, it doesn't make sense and, and, and to try, even if you incorporated a new building that looked like that would be kind of mimicry and disrespectful to it. And so, frankly, if the building was on the other side of the street and was a part of that long line of buildings where they're smaller scale, we, we, we may have considered it. There, are, there also are code, structural, functional, and aesthetic reasons why we chose not to preserved, say, CASA. Um, the building's not, you know, the CASA is not accessible. To make it accessible from, just from the ground floor in is, would, would, is a big deal. The entire interior of, the, of that building has been gutted. There's not, there's not a stitch of original interior detail in there that, that once you got into it, you'd say, aha, it's the railroad era hotel. The second floor, in fact, had been completely gutted. I don't know if everybody remembers the Jazz Hotel ca Cafe. Peter Richard had it for like a year. He ripped all the walls out of the middle of the building, we lost all of its lateral reinforcement. The building has a big three-inch kind of, kind of bow in it. Um, the exterior finishes themselves. Everything you see, except for the very top cornice, which is about a third of what was there, is not original. They're, they're mill-glazed clapboards from the 80s. They're 1980s vintage windows. That panel work that you see is all out of plywood. It wasn't done well, it wasn't done properly. So it's not as if this building has this, this you know, integrity. And I can, uh, so there's, there's that part. Um, the floor to floor heights would be different than the building we have, so kind of trying to match that all up. The building has one means of egress, it can't have one means of egress. These days, the means of egress we have to put in is a seven inch maximum riser, 11 inch minimum tread. These stairways start to get enormous. It's, it's just not particularly feasible to save the building. 
And then to have a wood frame building on, t on top of next to this building that we're proposing, which is a type one fireproof construction building, requires these massive firewalls to be built on two sides of it and over the top. It, it, when, you, when you're done with it, you, and, 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 but, we, but more to the point, we do believe that continuing the line to the campsite ran tool and turning it, frankly, rather tenderly around the corner to the park is, was the right approach, and, and, that's what, and that's what we did. My credibility regarding railroad era hotels, my master's thesis was for a railroad era uh, plot, uh, area in Ypsilanti, Michigan called Depot Town. I have an affinity for railroad era buildings. When I wrote Matt the email, it was because I, that town did not exist except for the railroad. It was a stop. Turns out to be also be where the Willow Run bomber plant ended up. But that, I get it. Beverly, it's, someone mentioned it's the third settlement in Massachusetts. They didn't come by the railroad. They landed up the river. So that's why, if, that's why, it doesn't mean I disrespect the railroad history, but I just look at what we have here, and I just, don't, I just didn't think the, the cost benefit was there. I look at all of what's happening on Rantoul now, from, from the bootstraps building all the way down uh, the, the old planters pub, those buildings are being restored now. I think it's a direct result of, of the work that has been done to improve all of Rantoul Street. I hope that answers your question. Uh, where's Miranda? There she is. Um, this project is clearly a transit-oriented development, and I appreciate that. Transit-oriented development uh, has my full support, and, and I believe is consistent with our master plan and with sane environmental practice. But I would like to consider the criteria for adequate and appropriate facilities. In your presentation, I recall no mention of building efficiency or efforts to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels for heating, air conditioning, or electricity generation. There's no mention of efforts to decrease greenhouse gas emissions or to minimize the project's overall carbon footprint. And this is disappointing to me that there's been no mention of this at all. It brings me to evaluate what exactly we mean by adequate and appropriate facilities. Um, this is, I, I frankly fear for our future overall if we just continue business as usual and disregard these very important concepts. I, I certainly appreciate your, your comments, Mr. Miller, and the lack of focusing on these is, is simply a factor of, of trying to get the presentation out as quickly as we can. Uh, we can tell you that we put solar panels on every roof. We have electric charging stations for vehicles. We have uh, recycling stations in, in, every, in every project. There's occupancy sensors for the lighting. There's the water saving features that you see that there's a high level of insulation, there's super energy efficiency, all these things get first tested. So when the buildings are done, they're extremely energy efficient. And we have bike rooms, we have programs where folks can get an MBTA pass. There's composting now provided in the building, in this building. Um, so I, I think, and in fact, the fact that there's one car per unit suggests that folks don't have multiple cars, they have the one car and they'll use the train, and they'll use, and, and therefore that'll, that'll be helpful to, for the environment. I suspect there's some others that I'm missing, but uh, that, we take that seriously. It's, it was the oversight I apologize for. It's frankly just trying to get all of these words out, um, and one evening has been tough. Thank you. Thad, while you're there, can I um, ask you, um, I guess I was a little bit disappointed in your comment that that Beverly wasn't developed via the railroad because the company that's employing you got the district registered as a national historical district and had tax credits based upon the development of by the railroad. So you sort of downplaying the significance of that is to my thinking a little disappointing, perhaps a little bit disingenuous. Um, my concern is and I wanted to follow up with Derek's question because it was pretty much my question. You have 
You talked about the long line of buildings coming down Rantoul Street and making the turn. I, I guess my question is, are you picking up, other than the post office, and there's certainly a lot of masonry, are you picking up any of the other historical aspects? I have no problem with the fact that you can't preserve Casa de Luca and you can't preserve the press box. But when I look at these buildings, do I see some historical uh, characteristic in them? Other than, I mean, I clearly see what you've done with the post office, and I appreciate that, because I think it's a really nice touch. But are we paying homage to, to the historical, the other historical buildings in that district in some way, or are we just continuing the, the, the long line of the, the masonry buildings, historical buildings, from Rantoul Street down the street? Yeah, I appreciate that. I probably jumped over that as well. So this is a large scale uh, portion of the building on Rantoul Street. Uh, this section here has the cast stone, which is that reference to the post office, which you can see that architrave with the colonnade. That's obviously reference to, historically referenced to the post office. There is a brick cornice on top of every time the brick of, a, of the building ends, it has, a, it has a cornice line which comes right out of the mill buildings that are around that area. There are cast stone sills and headers on this section of the building, traditionally divided windows, this attic story that you find historically, and this kind of sh uh, uh, base, shaft, and capital approach that you see in historic buildings you know, kind of everywhere. When you get to the section that's to the left, here, we, here as we head toward, a little bit more toward the mill section of town, we have soldier coursed arches over, over the windows uh, and brick headers here, that brick cornice that I mentioned, and these individual punched opening windows, which is, which is what occurs in the district. So that, that's where the history is coming from. It's, it's not a, it is not a direct copy, but I think even the proportion, when we looked at this elevation, the proportion of this building and the proportion of that building length to width is found through up, and, up and down the area. And, that, and those proportions are also what we, we picked up on. So I think there's, there's plenty of, of, if one looks for it, and that part what I mentioned about when you get a little closer to the building, you'll see it. Uh, the, so that detailing that comes from the traditional building trades and in, in, in the buildings in that area will, will come alive. And your, your two top floors, what color will they be? <laughs> uh, ethereal gray is the best answer that I have. <laughs> uh, they will be the color of a gray sky on a gray day, as best that I can describe it. I'd like I'm gone. The, um, the plaza, what, what, what roughly is the square footage of the, of the plaza that will be available to the general public? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that off the top of my head accurately. Well, we like to be accurate if we can. Just get, let me get something I can look at to... That's why Chris is here, right? Chris, do the math real quick. This is 20. This is 70, so that's 1,400 there. I think this is 50 by 90, 4,500. Excuse me, no questions at this point from the audience. Thank you. This section here, if you will, the no, sort of the majority public session, section is something like 20 by, by 120. So that's 2,400 square feet. And are you including the, the space that you are, that, that a 
uh, a retail tent at a restaurant or something might use for their outdoor dining? No, the 20 by 120 was this section right here, Madam Chair. That, that line there, I didn't, there is some section here as well that would be considered part of the, the public plaza as well, but I just, I just took the 20. I didn't even include the, the covered porch here. I just, that line there to there. It's in that range. So this building, I don't know, is at 80 feet by 40, so half the width by one and a half times the length of this building. It's something you know, kind of, sort of like that, I would say. Well, we're on this, just a, of that plaza again, the overall, is that all impervious surface? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, there is a raised, oh, impervious by the fact that there's, it's on top of the garage. I should probably slow down a bit. We have raised this section here and this section here with an 18 inch curb about the height of the stage and then mounted the soil so that we can, we can plant on it. So it will be planted, it will be green. Uh, and rain hits it, but it ultimately ends up hitting a, a roof membrane and being drained away. Other questions? I was curious, um, just going back to some of the comments made over here um, around parking. Certainly, I think people have raised valid concerns about parking in general in the area. I was curious whether, you know, then also picking up on some of Wayne's comments about certainly we want to encourage people not to bring cars. That's one of the pluses of this project. I was wondering if you've considered in any of your buildings, maybe all of your buildings, um, programs that would encourage people not to bring cars by either discounting their rent, subletting their parking, unused parking spaces. You know, have you considered any kinds of programs that would overall reduce even further the usage of parking? We could charge people to park and make it expensive so they don't have a car. That's one way that people do it in Boston. And they or reduce a lot more money. Or reduce their, you know, their rent if they were to not bring a car. I mean, I think you could either way. We hadn't considered that. We could consider that, sure. Yeah, we could look into that with our, with our management team, sure. Mm -hmm. I guess my other question would be, you know, I think certainly recognize that um, the slides around, you know, we. It's, it's great that um, you're able to say that the, um, you know, abutters are not seeing, obviously, a decrease in property values. You're seeing property values increase. I think we had some really helpful comments in the last hearing around um, the impact of luxury units on the affordability of, of other units in the city. You know, I think we know that already about half of renters pay more than a third of their income. Um, towards their housing, so affordability is a concern, and I just want to say how much I appreciate certainly the um, the additional, you know, the other units that are sort of not on site but are part of this package. I think they bring a lot of value to the city, and I'm certainly really excited about the deeper levels of affordability that we're getting. So I want to say that for sure, appreciate that. My bigger question would just be what your I would just love to hear a little bit more about what your considerations are in you know the potential of adding additional affordable units on site, in addition to the great work that had already happened, whether that's in any world feasible for you to increase affordability on site. I think we're providing deeper affordability off site at 50% and 30% AMI, uh, deeper than the ordinance uh, requires. And I think yeah, and that's what order, I, I appreciate order, that. I'm wondering if there was anything else to, on site. In order to be able to do that, that's, we don't have it here on site, so we're not considering them in this building. So it's not at all in con under consideration? It's not in consideration. Got it. Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay, just a few questions uh, from my notes. Can you just remind me, is it, how many parcels is this, was this, uh, before the proposed project? How many existing structures are on those parcels? Sure. Um, there are four units. There were four taxable units until recently. They, they have um, been since merged into common ownership um, in preparation for this package. But there was, uh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but one Park Street, sometimes called Three Park Street, which is the Press Box building. Um, Casa de Luca, 146 Rantoul Street, I believe. And um, then there's the Enterprise Building, 
which I apologize, I don't have the, the number in front of me, and then the, uh, the chiropractor building in the middle. And then on those parcels, which have been combined to one, there are, we know obviously the two structures, Casa de Luca building, the press box building, any other structures on those parcels? Yes, there's the enterprise, the enterprise. car rental, which right. used to be um, the glass, the glass, right. weaver glass, um, and then there's the um, chiropractor's building. Chiropractor, right, that's all kind of in one, right, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and then of those, what, does that entire new, um, combined parcel, does that fall all fall within the historic district or is it is there a line of demarcation? Um, it is entirely in the district, yes. And then you're proposing to demolish all of those buildings as part of the project? Correct. And can you just explain what procedural requirements are in place outside of this planning board that um, the property owner has to satisfy in order to move forward with demolishing those um, those buildings that are mm -hmm. afforded any historic protections? Sure. Um, so uh, the city of Beverly has a demolition delay ordinance um, under its, its local ordinances that requires um, building department sign off and then a referral to the historic district commission for any building that is over 50 years and that the commission determines is preferably preserved or historically significant. Um, so there's a whole process, public hearing process, and then um, which all of these buildings have been through. And in each case, uh, the commission voted to impose the demolition delay. Um, that delay has uh, long ago expired with respect to the uh, press box building and the chiropractor's building and um, is, is currently um, underway with respect to Casa de Luca. And I believe um, I believe it will expire in roughly April or May of next year. And before construction can begin, you have to, that specific delay has to expire April, May. Whenever Correct. It's okay. And is that the final step before demolition can take place with respect to the historic uh, nature of the parcels? Well, the, the time has to expire, as well as um, the ordinance reads that in order for the building inspector to then issue a new permit, there first has to be an approved plan for what is going to replace it. So that, and that is to pre prevent people from just going down and knocking down the buildings as soon as demolition delay has expired without having a new project to go in its place. Okay. Great, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the design the design aspect. I mean, first, I, I just want to say to that, you know, I, I really do think you should be applauded for the amount of work you put into this project. I've been on the board for a while now, um, and it really seems to me, from my perspective, this more work has gone into the design of this project than any other. Um, and a lot of the complaints that, that we have heard have been subjective. Um, I think some of them have been rather unfair to you. I think you should be applauded for your work. People may not um, aesthetically agree with you, um, but I do think that no one can deny the amount of work you put into it. So thank you for that. Um, that being said, I want to discuss, you know, my concern, uh, I think, with respect to the height and the height ordinance for the City of Beverly. I've voiced it before on other projects. Uh, it's relatively well known. Um, I understand what you're doing to try to um, comply with the tall building uh, ordinance and what you're trying to do visually uh, to mitigate the height of the building. Um, my other concern is really the density, the feeling that we have these multiple parcels merged into one on which a large building is going to sit. And I'm just wondering if you could just highlight for me um, ways in which the design attempts to minimize the, the density and, and then if maybe we can look at some areas of the project and my question would be can some of those attempts being used in the courtyard area be carried over to any of the other aspects of the project. Uh, thanks for the kind words, by the way. Let's see if I can get to. I'm probably going the wrong way here. The um, the strategy knowing that it was a whole block, was to, 
to suggest that while it is one building and needs to function as one building, that we could divide it into several, frankly, several buildings, right? And the tall guidelines almost speak to that when they talk about that 45-foot cornice height, that you have this cornice line and the stuff that's up there, and it does work, we think, for the most part, is, is does not impact the street. It just, it, just gives you, it just gives you some additional units, right, which can help pay for a more elaborate facade, a more elaborate street life, pay for the sidewalks all around the property and across the street, all of that. So what we did here on, on Rantoul Street is on the far left, we have what we think is a nice horizontal four-story building with, that has the blue awnings, feels like a single storefront. Then there's a break, not unlike what we did at the Montserrat dorm. And then there is another taller, vertically oriented building that has a lot of the proportions that we find in like the Porter Mill and, those, and, and 60 Pleasant. So while it is in fact one building where the, the impact to try to reduce the apparent mass and the density is, is, to, is to create this idea that it's both, both one and two, if you will, but essentially feels like two. That's why we changed the storefront color. That's why we changed the storefront height. That's why the glass is out in one part and it's set back in another. That continues around. Certainly the, the, um, this leg here, maybe it's better seen here. Y you know, I, I think to the naked eye, this would appear to be two buildings, the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the right is up on the street. It's a, it's a slightly more industrial kind of, a later industrial feel to it, a little more national grid, if you will. Uh, and the one on the left is a little more downtown, a little more elegant. Uh, still using the same color brick, still having the same brick cornice, cornices, but that introduction of the cast, uh, the cast stone facade that, that's coming off of the formality of the post office is, is there. So this isn't one building, it's, you know, it, it feels, I hope, like it's two buildings, and then there's that connector in between that's the residential entrance. And the hope is that the fifth and sixth floors are, are kind of out of play. They, they are as far back in that back corner as we possibly can put them. And again, the sixth floor is, is half of the, of the lot area. So that's, that was the strategy. And I think as you go around the building, even here, sorry, uh, going the wrong way. Even here, we looked at that, the, the width of the press box building and our and our building on the left, that first brick section is the width of the press box building, essentially. That feels, we hope, like a continuation of that building on, on the lower uh, Railroad Avenue. Then there's the break, and then there's another corner brick building that kind of breaks out. So that was our attempt uh, to create, to reduce the apparent mass of the building while still having, you know, the amount of building that, that, we, that we provided. And that continues on Pleasant Street where we aggregated the decks together so that instead of having individual setback decks by putting those all together, it helps create a pretty substantial relief as one is, is on Pleasant Street. So those are the kind of tricks. The corners of the building on, uh, were made into decks to help reduce the corner mass. So if you're looking at, sorry, not use this remote, sorry, I apologize. If you're looking at, Ran Tool Street, oops, one more. You know, these corners on the far left are, are also kind of eroded. And the balconies, uh, there's a double set of balconies on that left building that are pulled together to try to, again, reduce the apparent mass and perforate the building and push it back. So those are all the tricks uh, that, you know, we've used as many as we could think of to, again, reduce the apparent mass, uh, you know, the building. Some of it's color, some of it is, is manipulation of forms, and some of it's use of materials. Hope that helps. Uh, Mr. Barrett, one thing too. We have 12 studio units in here, so while it sounds like uh, a higher density number, these are smaller units, and that seems to be what folks demand so that we can try to reduce the rent for folks getting an entry level into these kinds of, uh, of buildings that have these kinds of amenities in these areas. So that's another thing that it sounds like a big number, but the one bedrooms and the studios uh, help uh, with that calculation. So. 
Could you give the number breakout of the units, the two, one in studios? Yep. Uh, do you have the slide? <laughs> I think it's 12 studios. There's one one bedroom den. 80 81 bedrooms. Two one bedroom dens. 17 two bedrooms. Likely have two baths. That's and and just on a related point while you're there. Yeah. Is there anything from your experience at 131 uh, on, back on the parking issue and the likelihood that the proposed number of spaces is gonna be enough yeah. for, um, for the residents? Sure. Anything that, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, you may not have the data, but anything you can tell from your experience at 131, which also has a mix, I think, of um, different size apartments, and I think only one parking space per apartment. One, one per unit. Uh, as is the proposed here, and I mean that. I, it, I'm that's my building, so I, I'm Understood. speaking in part from my own observation. But but um, I. I I take it it's working there, and do you know anything about whether people are having second cars that they're having to find places to to park so elsewhere? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we have 292 parking spaces on the street right now in five properties in our buildings. Uh, we counted them um, at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m. Our average utilization is 52% during that, that whole time. Our peak utilization uh, average uh, at 8 p.m. was 69%. That's on those five properties, which includes 131. Uh, it includes uh, Link 480. It includes uh, Enterprise 50 Broadway. Uh, those properties that we counted close, not McKay, so it's closer to the depot area. Uh, your question about flats. So the garage uh, on average is 51% empty, and the surface park in this 36 spaces in the back, those are 58% uh, generally utilized. That. So, yes, it seems like most spaces are going not utilized on average. But does that just mean they're empty during the day because the people are out at work or something? Or are you, are you saying they're not well, used so, at all? Well, uh, we counted them at 8 We just counted them at 8 p.m. I guess we could take another count at, at 2 a.m. or something and see, see what they're utilized. But uh, at 8 p.m., the garage, when we counted it for a, a full week on July 9th, through July 15th, so it was 59% utilized at 8 p.m., the garage, and the par surface spaces in the back were 61%. So we just counted the cars, and that's, that's what was there. Um, we think it's working, over to answer your question, we do think the parking is working. Um, and I think if you look at an aggregate number, I know the, the mayor has looked into this, uh, the mayor's office and the planning, I think it's about 0.89 is the utilization if you add in all the data uh, of utilized parking per unit. Thank you. And my, my other question, if I may, um, uh, is just sort of back to basics here. Um, can you remind us um, which, of the, which, which of the stories uh, of the structure gets us into the, the need to be here and asking us for permission to put them on? Um, that I guess that's the first question. Uh, the cutoff is fifty five feet. Uh, fifty five feet occurs about halfway up the uh, fifth floor because the way you calculate grade in Beverly is the average grade around the building. So as I pointed out, there's a 13 foot drop from the highest point to the lowest point. So that, that causes, if you will, a penalty of about six and a half feet. Um, so 
typically a five story, the, the intent of the 55 feet is to get a five story building in, which is what happened at 131 and, and, and the other five story buildings that you see. But beca uh, because of that penalty of the, of the slope on the back side, uh, the 55 feet runs through, as I said, roughly the middle of the fifth floor here. So am I, am I right to put that sort of another way? If you wanted to build a four-story building um, and put a parking lot out behind, you wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be, you know, critiquing the cornices and, and, uh, uh, and, and all this stuff. I mean, the, the fact that we're able to do this is just, is, is, is purely, there's a lot that the landowner could, the, the owner of the site could do on this property, which we'd be much less happy with, <laughs> I guess is my point, and would have no say whatsoever over, uh, you know, but for the, the couple, of, couple of extra stories. Um, we would miss out on all the fun, though. <laughs> Indeed. I think it's fair to say that we would be clever enough to get a full five-story building in here with the, with the standard site plan review and not to have to be at the tall building guideline area. Uh, we think that the, tall, the extra floor gives us the ability to, pr to produce a really, a really nice building. You know, the, that density pays for some really great detailing and, some and, 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 a, and a better building and a garage that's that's safe and out of view, and all those uh, attributes that I've been describing over the last several meetings. Three, there we go. Um, so just a, a couple of uh, follow-ups. Um, one, um, in terms of the condition of the Casa de Luca building. Yes, sir. Did you know the condition of that building when you bought it? Well, fortunately, I never bought it myself. Uh, well, you know what I'm asking, right? I mean, is it a surprise? Yeah. Because in the letter to, I think it's Secretary of State's office, um, where it was indicated that, you know, um, efforts were going to be made to rehabilitate it, and there were not plans to demolish it, things like that. And then tonight, what I'm hearing is it's just too difficult to save. So I'm trying to figure out which storyline I should listen to. Um, I think, first of all, I just want to clarify, and, and I re recognize this, this is a distinction, perhaps without meaning to members, but I think it's important just so the record does not get more muddied. Um, the building that was the subject of the correspondence with the Secretary of State's office was not Casa de Luca. Um, it was the press box. Um, so I, I just want to be clear on the record with respect to that. Um, and um, as to whether the condition was known, I believe that there was a rough idea about the, you know, it, it doesn't. I think the condition of the building can be largely discerned from an outside visual inspection as to the, the extent of the bow, for example. Um, and I think that members, um, that the developer certainly had been in the building and, and understood that it was in uh, perhaps not as bad shape as the press box building, but um, not too far removed from it. Thank you. Um, the second question I have is a follow-up to a question that um, I asked uh, Andrew DeFranza. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you were here for that meeting where uh, I was asking about the situation for what's traditionally been an area uh, very affordable to moderate income people, uh, say between Cabot and Rantoul. Um, something that's a little close to my heart because when I first moved to Beverly, when my children who are now in their 30s were in the single digits, it was um, to an area very similar to that on Pickett Street and was mm -hmm. able to live 
in an apartment in the first floor of a nice house with a little yard, et cetera, et cetera, because it was affordable and within reach. It wasn't in, you know, it was, it was within reach for a family. So um, when I asked Andrew whether he was concerned about upward pressure on rates, uh, rental rates, um, he indicated that there was some. Now, there may not be scientific information collected on that yet, but I'm curious about two things. One, because you've identified that this is a very expensive project, and I certainly appreciate that, um, that there must be a cost analysis that's done, certainly for the taxes and all the other stuff, in terms of what the expected rental rates are for each level, um, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and how that correlates to the 30% income level for families, 30% um, of income to pay for rent. So I'm just trying to figure out how much over that threshold you anticipate um, the units within the uh, uh, proposed project are. Uh, Chris, do you, I would expect you have an anticipated rental range. We can certainly come back with that information at the next hearing. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's somewhat a stab in the dark, at, given where we are in terms of um, the project actually coming online. Um, but we can certainly try to do some of that analysis um, with respect to, you know, what what I don't know if you're if you're getting at sort of an analysis of what the income levels of current residents are and how that computes the 30 percent. I'm not sure that we have that data. We don't collect that data on, I, I should, for all of your residents? For all of our properties, the average income is 114,000 reported income. So uh, on an average rent of $2,000, you know, 24,000 over a year, they're, they're not in that bracket generally. And that includes the 50, roughly 50 affordable units that we have mm -hmm. in our current portfolio. So those are, it's not, we're not adjusting those, people, those folks out. It's okay, it, it would be great to see that, and maybe you could reference um, the 2017 um, housing study um, to get uh, a um, clearer picture of what average income of Beverly residents are um, yeah. who are renters and owners. Okay. That, would be, that would be helpful information for me. Okay, I'll, yeah. Thank you. Okay, our next public uh, hearing is scheduled to start at 9.45. So uh, if in, with the board's uh, approval, my suggestion would be that we continue this public hearing to our October 22nd meeting. We can finish up any questions uh, related to tonight's uh, topic and we'll address the parking and traffic that night. That would be great, thank you. Motion by Mr. Barrett, seconded by Ms. Flannery. Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would also. Yes. Okay. Let's. Um, can I get a motion to recess uh, until uh, 9.50? All in favor? All opposed. Thank you. We're in recess. For members of the audience, members of the audience, if you're wondering what, and I apologize, I should have explained it. I just wanted to get it under the wire. Um, we have to start our next public hearing at 945, and so that we can all get home at a reasonable hour tonight versus midnight the last time. Um, we're going to keep to that schedule to start our next public hearing at 945. This public hearing will be continued to our next meeting, which is October 22nd. Parking and traffic will be discussed that night. And it's anticipated that members of the public will have a chance to ask questions and comment that evening as well. So thank you very much. We're in break for about five minutes. Thank you. All right, we're back to our public hearing. 
Our next agenda item is number four on our list, um, continued public hearing, site plan review number 143-19, and special permit 173-19, construct a three-story restaurant containing ground floor amenities, including restrooms, snack bar, and small commercial space for water-related retail or recreational use on land owned by the city of Beverly. Uh, located at 1 Water Street, the applicant is Beverly Restaurant Associates, LLC, care of Glovsky and Glovsky, LLC. Ms. Gooding, you're up. Uh, good evening. Members of the board, again, Miranda Gooding. Um, and on behalf of Beverly Restaurant Associates, we have a, a team here this evening, starting with Marty Bloom, who is the principal of the applicant and uh, the developer, proposed developer of the restaurant. Uh, Scott Cameron from the Morin Cameron uh, Group, the site engineers. Um, Rebecca Brown from GPI and her colleague, Doug Halpert, also from GPI, who are the traffic consultants on this project. Um, given the late hour and that we do anticipate a high degree of public comment and questions regarding this project and that the board is going to want to hear from, from the public, as do we, um, we have decided to focus tonight's presentation primarily on parking and traffic um, with the design presentation and the special permit criteria presentation to be presented at the next public hearing. Um, the reason for that is, uh, I'll just let you know, um, the project has been to DRB a couple of times um, in an, and we are slated to be there Thursday night um, with some pretty significant modifications to the design um, and, and in furtherance of that discussion. So we'd like to hold off presenting the project until we have DRB approval. Um, in contrast, uh, I'm pleased to, to report that we received a favorable unanimous vote from Parking and Traffic Commission earlier this morning recommending the project. Obviously, uh, members of this board do not have the written recommendation yet, but I suspect that you will have that before the next, um, the next meeting. And as we, you know, I think anticipate all of us that, that the real concerns for this project and the inquiry is going to be about parking and traffic and how the area supports it, we thought it made sense to, to have uh, Rebecca uh, lead with her presentation on that this evening to start things off. Um, we are going to do a, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the, the site history, really brief. Scott Cameron is, is before we get to parking and traffic, is going to give you sort of the civil engineering presentation, which um, is pretty brief with this project. But you'll have that, you'll have that done, and then we'll go into parking and traffic. Um, So um, I, I think everybody is very familiar with this site. Um, and I may have lost my pointer in this um, with all of these, but um, thanks. Okay. That works. OK, good. So the subject site, One Water Street, um, is right here. Um, it's an approximately one acre site improved with a vacant one story former McDonald's restaurant building which, as members know, has been vacant since approximately 1996. Um, there are currently about 36 parking spaces um, on the site, though as this um, slide notes, for those of you who may be able to read it, the applicant proposes to increase that, uh, the number of parking spaces to 60 spaces when all is said and done. The site's located in the Beverly Harbor uh, District Zoning District. Um, adjacent uses. Um, or adjacent city uses, actually. Um, this is the Harbor Master site. Um, Glover Wharf is here, the, the seaward side of the One Water Street and the city's uh, recreational marina slips. And um, likewise, here um, in front of the Harbor Master building are, is the city's um, commercial marina. Um, on the Harbor Master building, there are approximately 48 parking spaces that are already laid out beneath the bridge and on the site. Um, as outlined in the application submitted with the board, the city acquired this parcel in 1996 through an urban self-help grant from the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. 
Um, notably, the grant application in, 1970, in 1996 sought the acquisition for the property to be used as a restaurant um, and or recreational uses. And the grant was ultimately made with the expectation that this property would be used for a restaurant. And um, since then, several project amendments, project grant amendments have been um, negotiated by the city to allow for the use that's here before you tonight. Um, since the city acquired the property, as, as many folks will know, there have been multiple requests for proposal for the redevelopment of the site, in each case seeking commercial and or recreational uses that would, would try to activate the city's waterfront um, by the, and, and encourage greater use by the general public. Um, the last real, real prospect for this site was a similar sized restaurant project proposed and approved by this planning board um, at its predecessors over a decade ago before ultimately being stalled by regulatory appeals. Mr. Bloom's proposal was selected as the winning proposal in response to the most recent RFP in the fall of, 19, of 2018. Uh, his proposal involves the long-term lease for 40 years of the property, which, and that lease has already been negotiated, executed, and approved by the City Council. Under the terms of the lease, Mr. Bloom is responsible for building the restaurant building and related infrastructure, as well as for compliance with the overlapping regulatory requirements for public access amenities on this site. It's a challenging, it's a challenging site. Um, there is a storied history of stop and start projects here. I, I would say that the mayor's office has worked incredibly hard to try to solve the puzzle of the various overlapping and sometimes conflicting regulatory frameworks affecting the proposed restaurant and the recreational uses that are proposed. The good news is that the current applicant is an experienced restaurateur with experience specifically developing waterfront restaurants of, comp of comparable size, notably Mission on the Bay and Swampscott, among others. This site and the partnership with the city that any private developer is really entering into actually demands that kind of experience, as well as the resources and the scale to pull off this operation. It is not for the uh, weak of heart, nor is it for an inexperienced business person. And I think that these considerations will arise later in the context of the board's special permit considerations. Um, Finally, before I turn this over to uh, Marty to, to say a few words, I just want to run through some of the other permits that are required for this project besides planning board site plan review and special permit. Um, there is a notice of intent uh, requirement to be filed with the Conservation Commission and that has already been done and the public hearings have already opened on that application and Scott can answer any questions that the board has about those proceedings but they are running in tandem, we expect, with, with this board's deliberations. Um, similarly, we will be filing for a Chapter 91 waterways application with MassDEP to allow a non-water dependent use on filled tidelands. Um, and we will be filing an ENF with MEPA for a preliminary project review of the environment, environmental impacts of this project. Um, and as I said, uh, we've already uh, obtained parking and traffic recommendation earlier today and are, are making our way through design review board. So I think that, that sort of gives you a view of where we are um, in the process. And with that, I'd like to um, ask Marty to introduce himself and, um, and then we'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you all. I am Marty Bloom, lifelong restaurant guy, been doing this about 40 years. This should, I think, is either the 31st or 32nd restaurant that I have been involved with. This is all I do. Um, probably best noted for uh, starting and, uh, and developing the Vinny Testa's chain, which was all around the region for quite a few years. We had 11 of those in three states. And uh, this project uh, just kept on creeping up on me, to be honest with you, because uh, you do need somebody very experienced who, who knows how to get their way through all the, all the different, uh, different boards, which I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience doing it for a lot of years. And uh, it is not an easy project, as, as Miranda said. There's a lot of, a lot of hurdles to cross, and which means that you have to have deep pockets and, and a lot of patience to get through all this, which I do. I think it's worthwhile. I think it's uh, when, when you see all the, the different designs and everything else that we've come up with that's gone through all the different boards, I think you'll be very pleased with what you're going to get. So I'm here to answer questions. And so, as I said, we're going to get through all the design stuff, and I'll explain to you more about the operations. But 
As you know, we have two restaurants here. We have Mission on the Bay in Swampscott. We have Mission Oak Grill up in Newburyport, and I own two Mexican restaurants also in Boston called Borough Bar, one in Brookline, one in the South End. So those are the four restaurants I'm operating at the moment, and this will be the fifth. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to probably skip through some of the more technical plans, but I will go through and start with the uh, I'm going to skip through the floor plans here for the next presentation at the following meeting. Yep. I'm sorry. Yes, my name is Scott Cameron with the Mooring Cameron Group. Uh, as Attorney Gooding had uh, introduced the team, I, I failed to do that in uh, my turn. But uh, we went through the site locus plan. I think the only other item I would add to this, uh, as far as additional parking, there's also a lot you'll see referenced as the creamery lot that's located here. In this plan, your packet indicated uh, the walking routes to the site, uh, either under the bridge directly on the board, boardwalk or cutting across the crosswalk in the intersection. I'm sorry? There will be 24 additional parking spaces added to the site, and I'll go through that. Um, in the presentation uh, of the plans, uh, on the cover sheet here, you'll see the drawing index. I'm happy to answer any specific questions you have about these plans. I'm going to skip through to the site layout plan, which will illustrate the parking, and then go through the grading and drainage plan. as probably two, usually the two focal points of our presentations. Uh, existing conditions, this is erosion control plan. And we come to the site plan. Uh, so this is the uh, horizontal uh, configuration of the development proposal. Uh, on the top of the plan sheet, you have Cabot Street. This is the intersection with Water Street. And then this spur off of Water Street would be your access into the site and the frontage of the property here. Uh, it does enjoy frontage on Cabot Street as well, but the access will be through the Water Street spur. This is actually a restricted uh, access. They can't put a curb cut directly under Cabot Street, so that was not an option here. Uh, as you come into the site, uh, the existing restaurant sits approximately in this location. Uh, that will be raised. Uh, so we've designed a configuration where you come in and there's parking, two parking aisles. Uh, this has gone through the parking traffic uh, review with the conditional approval today. Um, I will note the one item we will be uh, adjusting on this is one of the conditions of approval is uh, adding a connection through at the bottom here so you can actually do a loop of the parking area and back up and see the current and aisles. Um, in total, I know we have 16 spaces on the premises. Uh, this is an increase from about 36 on the site now. And uh, access to the lobby of the building will be in this portion. So there's parking and walkways along the entire front of the building to get people in. And then uh, you will have other access points on the back side of the building. Uh, a big focal point with this design being a waterfront project was the pedestrian access to the site. The vibrancy of the, of the waterfront really connecting that to adjacent waterfront uses. Uh, directly next door to the property is Ferry Landing Park, and this has uh, a sidewalk with stairs that comes down from Cabot Street and kind of winds through down to the, the pier in this location. Uh, as part of the project proposal, we are proposing a, another stair connection, uh, which are needed for the grade change, but just another route that brings it towards this site here, so people have an option to go towards the Harbor Master or towards the site here. This will improve flow down perpendicular to the waterfront from the street. Uh, to the main wharf area. Same on this side, we're proposing a new crosswalk, handicapped curb ramp, which doesn't exist now, and a new 10-foot wide walkway extend all the way down and connect to the walkway that runs parallel with the waterfront on the adjacent property, and then also connect you to Glover's Wharf in this area. Um, the improvements to the wharf are, I would say, significant. It is currently uh, just a concrete wharf uh, with a railing on it. It uh, transitions pretty quickly into a gravel area. Uh, people are parking, there, there's a little fishing off of it. Uh, and then you have slips for the boats right off of the wharf here. Um, I, in a meeting yesterday with Captain Holleran and uh, several fire department staff, they actually did indicate that they tie up the fire boat right here off the wharf, uh, which is why one of the reasons why they, they were not concerned with being able to provide emergency service to the building either from the water or from the street side. And we had a favorable letter uh, recommendation from them received yesterday. Um, the proposal is to raise uh, a pavilion up in this area in front of the building. Uh, this will be for outside seating, uh, breakout space. This is all public area. 
uh, portable furniture, so chairs and tables and, and areas where people can, can sit and relax and be on the waterfront and enjoy that amenity. It's handicap accessible. There will be a small landscape uh, area in front of that in the existing concrete wharf. Uh, there will also be uh, stair connections on each side of it. And the other important aspect of this, uh, as you will see in a future presentation, is the access to the waterfront uh, retail and other amenity spaces that will be incorporated as part of this project on the ground level. Uh, we did go through the floor plans, but I'll mention briefly that there will be a ground level snack bar, uh, drink bar, retail space, uh, which could be for uh, some water dependent use, uh, surf shop or whale watch, or it's not programmed yet. But all those amenities will be directly accessible and directly oriented towards the waterfront. And so our intention with the design was to maximize the waterfront facing portion of the building, which is still not that wide, um, to optimize that interface with the, with the, with the waterfront uh, compared to other alternatives which had a, a different building more orientating towards a parking area, not necessarily towards the waterfront. So it was a big emphasis. And we also moved that building uh, down towards the waterfront to make sure it's engaged. Uh, we're currently under review with the Conservation Commission. We'll be before them uh, on Tuesday uh, with our second hearing with them. I will also mention that solid waste will be within the building, so the dumpster uh, will be in the building and accessed uh, in, in the morning hours for pickup and removal. And there will also be two covered parking spaces also open to the public uh, just under the building. On the grading plan, uh, I just wanted to note uh, the engineering department, we did receive comments back from them today. Uh, I would say that the letter we received is perfectly acceptable. It was more just uh, specific detail on how they wanted the operation and maintenance plan to be written. Uh, they did ask us to include a snow storage area, which I anticipate will be at the uh, northerly end of the site in this open easement area, which will just be loaned and seeded uh, in the, the obvious push point for snow. So we'll, we will make that adjustment. From a stormwater perspective, this was a fairly straightforward design. Um, uh, the current site, the water flows off the site directly into the ocean. There's no treatment or renovation of the stormwater runoff, so whatever falls in the ground goes directly into the ocean with whatever's in that stormwater runoff. The way we've engineered the site is to, instead of a runoff condition, we're actually collecting. So the water will go into the site now through a treatment system consisting of catch basins, an actual treatment uh, structure here that will further renovate and clean the stormwater before it discharges out to the ocean. So this is a considerably better uh, condition than what is there now. Uh, we've also situated so the parking is on the opposite side of the building. So the building itself is acting as a break between the coastal waterfront and the parking areas, which has an environmental benefit and also keeps that pedestrian oriented frontage on the waterfront separated from the parking. That was a big aspect of the design. Um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to wrap it up. If there's any other questions on the site, uh, uh, I, I can address those at any time. I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca Brown for the traffic presentation. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Rebecca Brown. I'm here with Greenman Peterson. Um, did, did you say you needed the address as well? Okay. <laughs> it's um, 181 Ballardvale Street in Wilmington, Massachusetts. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll get those to you after. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to kind of walk briefly through a little bit of the, the traffic study that um, we put together. Um, and then I really want to focus most of the time tonight talking about um, the two big issues that I think people really have, which is how is the traffic going to be managed? Um, and what is the parking um, situation going to look like? Where is everybody going to park um, for this development? And kind of talk about um, our review process with the Parking and Traffic Commission and um, what their recommendations were. Um, in terms of the conditions of our approval. Um, so the traffic study that we did, um, this is showing kind of the study area that we looked at. Um, and you can see uh, the site is located right here. Um, just to orient you, this is uh, Route 1A, Rantoul Street, 
um, Cabot Street running through here, um, and then Water Street along here. Um, so the study area that we looked at included the intersection of Route 1A with Water Street, Front Street, and Goat Hill Lane. Also the intersection of Rantoul Street and Cabot Street. Um, Rantoul Street at School Street, and then Route 1A at Congress Street here. Um, and this intersection was actually added by um, parking and traffic um, because of the access to the what's been called the Harbor Street lot here at um, 11 Cabot Street, where a lot of the vehicles would be parked in that location and coming in and out through Congress Street. Um, so that one was added um, in addition. Um, the traffic study that we looked at looked at both the uh, safety characteristics of all of these study area intersections as well as how these intersections would operate both with and without the site related traffic. Um, so I want to just talk briefly about the, the safety aspect and then I'll go more in detail into the, the traffic operations that I think that people are a little bit more concerned with. So um, in terms of the safety, we looked at the collision history for each of the study area intersections. Um, over a five-year study period from 2013 to 2017. Um, and what we found was that there was really only one, um, one intersection within the study area that had a notable collision occurrence. All the others had uh, fewer than three crashes per year on average um, and crash rates that were well below the state and district-wide averages. Um, the only notable one was the intersection um, here at Route 1A, Water Street, Front Street um, and Goat Hill Lane. That intersection is proposed to be reconstructed by MassDOT um, beginning actually um, in this coming spring um, and will include significant safety upgrades, um, new traffic signal equipment, um, new striping, narrowing the roadway to reduce the the crossing distances for some pedestrians, um, removing the slip lane that goes onto Cabot Street. And I'll show in a few minutes the, um, the plan that actually shows what those improvements do entail, but there are a number of improvements that are being proposed there that uh, should reduce the, the collision occurrence at that location. Um, as I mentioned, all of the other intersections within the study area showed that there's no real um, safety issues that are going on at those in terms of um, the collision occurrence. Uh, we did also look at uh, site distances coming out of our site driveway to ensure that those um, are adequate for people to be able to see to turn out onto Water Street. Um, and looking to the east down Water Street, oh, um, down in this direction here, um, the sight lines there are actually over 500 feet, which are well in excess of what um, AASHTO requires um, for uh, minimum sight distances. Looking back in the other direction, you can see all the way to the signalized intersection with, um, with Route 1A in that direction as well. Um, so, so sight lines looked good in, in both directions. Um, as part of the traffic study, we collected traffic counts um, at each of these study area intersections. Um, the time periods that we looked at were the weekday evening peak hours and the Saturday um, midday peak hours, which coincide with um, the adjacent street traffic and the peak times for um, the restaurant when the, when the two of those would be the heaviest. Um, the counts were originally done on uh, Thursday, May 30th and Saturday, June 1st. Um, and then the additional count was added um, down here at the Congress Street intersection um, on June 6th and June 8th um, to add that additional location. Um, when we did the counts the first time, um, Cabot Street here had a detour that was going on during the evening peak hour. So we ended up going back out and redoing that count um, again um, once the, uh, the detour was opened up. And so that count was redone on, on June 13th. Um, so all of those were done while school was still in session, but while waterfront activity um, on the weekends was starting to pick up. And we did look at seasonal adjustment factors um, for these traffic counts. Um, in general, May and June traffic volumes um, are about four to nine percent higher than an average month condition. Um, so we left these volumes unadjusted so that we could show a conservative estimate of the um, 
of the traffic conditions under an existing condition. And then we grew those traffic volumes out to a 2026 condition um, using a 0.5% per year growth rate, um, which historic traffic counts in this area are showing about a 0.2% per year. Um, so that 0.5% per year is a little bit higher than what historic growth rates are showing. Um, and then we also included traffic that would be generated by a number of other developments that are proposed in the area, including the Kelly Ford site that's under redevelopment right now, and then the, um, the 132 Rental Street project that you just heard earlier this evening as well. Um, in the event that that does move forward, we've also included um, their traffic in our study as well. Um, and then we also included the improvements that are being proposed by MassDOT um, at this intersection. So once we had our baseline condition, um, including all of those adjustments out to a future year, we looked at how much traffic is our site um, actually going to generate. And to estimate that, we used um, standard trip rates that are published in the Institute of Transportation Engineers, or ITE, um, trip generation manual for a, a quality restaurant. Um, and then there is also a snack shack component that is proposed on the site for, as a public amenity. So we did also include the snack shack um, in here as well as, as more of like a fast food type of restaurant um, when doing the, the traffic analysis. Um, and this is showing you kind of what we were estimating for trips. And we did assume that a number of the, um, the snack shack patrons would be people who are already coming to the waterfront. Um, they're already in the area and they would choose to come here to get food so that they don't have to go elsewhere. Um, so we did apply a 50% credit that's shown as a walking biking credit. But what that really accounts for is the people who are already downtown in the waterfront area that are coming over to the snack shack to get um, food. Um, and then obviously with this being a restaurant use, um, there is also a, a pass-by component associated with it where people may be on their way home from work, they're stopping in, having drinks, having a bite to eat with their friends, and then they continue on home in the evening. Um, Can I? Just quickly, and sure. with while, while we're on this point, why did you include only weekday PM and not Saturday and Sunday PM? Um, so we included the the weekday PM and the Saturday midday um, peak periods, and that's generally considered to be um, like a standard in in traffic analysis. So that the weekday evening peak, I think we can all agree, is that's the peak of the adjacent street plus what the peak of the, um, the generator would be, where they're really gonna coincide. Um, so that's the time that the restaurant is gonna be, uh, on a weekday, the restaurant is gonna be at its peak in the evening. And right. so will the But wouldn't you wanna know what street. the current conditions on a Saturday night are uh, so on before a, you add a restaurant? Yep, so what we try to look at is the critical time period, so when the traffic is going to be at its highest, when you combine both site-generated traffic and the traffic that's already on the street. During that um, Saturday evening time period, there's not a lot of traffic that's out on the street in general. The midday is much higher in comparison to, um, to that Saturday evening peak time period. So yes, the, the site certainly will generate more traffic during the evening peak hour than it would during the Saturday. But in terms of traffic that's on the adjacent street, um, traffic volumes tend to be much, much lower um, in the evenings compared to the, uh, the midday. And certainly we can pull that information out to tell you a rough percentage, how that compares. But um, in general, that's, those are the time periods that are typically looked at for, for restaurant use as well, not just um, for other uses. Um, but so in general, when we look at um, all of these factors combined, what we see is an, an increase in traffic generated by the project of um, roughly 58 vehicle trips during the weekday evening peak hour um, and 74 vehicle trips during that Saturday midday um, peak hour that would be generated by the, the project. And again, a trip is either one vehicle entering or one vehicle exiting the site. Um, so that 58 trips, it, it represents 46 people roughly coming in in that evening peak and another 12 um, exiting. Um, the Saturday midday is pretty similar in terms of distribution where 47 cars would be coming in, 27 leaving um, during that time period. 
Um, so this figure here is, is kind of showing where we anticipate that traffic will be um, headed to and from. Um, so we're estimating, um, based on existing travel patterns in and around the waterfront, that approximately 50% of the vehicles would be headed to and from the south along Route 1A. Um, about 25% would be to and from the, the north along Rantoul Street, 15% out along Cabot Street, and roughly 10% out along um, Water Street um, coming to and from the site. 10% on Water Street. I, I'm sorry, this isn't the time for questions. You'll, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, but we want the uh, traffic to be able to give their presentation. And so this is um, just to kind of explain these distributions. So um, obviously our driveway is on Water Street and there's also location off, off of um, Cabot Street. So people will be coming to those locations, but this is sort of looking at from the surrounding area, um, what streets are people taking to get to the site? So people coming down um, Rantoul Street and Cabot Street may turn onto Water Street and come into the parking lot. But in terms of coming from Water Street out to the east, that's what that 10% is representing. Um, so this just breaks down um, the site generated trip and shows you how many trips is that really on each of the roadways. Um, so you can see that it ranges from anywhere to six new trips um, on any of the study area roadways to 36 um, new trips, which is in the range of one additional vehicle every two to 10 minutes, um, depending on the roadway that you're looking at. Um, now, one thing that's not reflected in the, the uh, trip generation estimate is that we have been very conservative in our assumptions um, there are a number of transportation demand management measures that would be implemented that would assist in reducing the vehicle trips that would be generated by the project. Um, for example, even the location of the site being in the downtown area um, with strong pedestrian and bicycle access, um, the proximity to public transportation facilities, the commuter rail station nearby, all would lend itself well to having um, pedestrian and bicycle activity, um, as well as transit um, trips to and from the site. Um, with the number of residences and businesses in the area as well, um, a number of people may walk over um, that are already working or living in the area may walk over and use the restaurant. Um, and no credits have been applied for any of those factors. Um, there's also planned to be an off-site employee parking location to reduce the parking demand in this downtown area um, around the waterfront. Um, right now, uh, negotiations are in place with, um, with the Kelly Ford site to um, park vehicles at that location. So 25 um, employee parking spaces would be located there with an employee shuttle that would uh, bring them back and forth. Um, we're also looking at options for using that um, employee shuttle to provide a patron shuttle service to and from the MBTA station as well. Um, since the, the operations for an employee would be much earlier where most employees would arrive by four o'clock um, and would tend to leave in the 10 to midnight range. Um, and in between, that same um, shuttle could be used to get the patrons to and from the site as well. Um, we also plan to partner with the North Shore TMO, um, Mass Rides and New Ride, who are all um, services that assist in developing TDM measures, offering incentives to employees um, to, to take greener trips um, using walking, biking. They offer guaranteed ride home services for anyone who may choose to carpool or walk or bike to work um, to guarantee that if they had an emergency, they could get home. Um, if needed. We'll also be providing um, bicycle racks and locker rooms on the site for any employees who may choose to um, bike to work as well. Um, and the employee shifts obviously will be arranged to avoid those peak hours of operation as well. Um, as I mentioned, most employees will arrive before four o'clock, before that evening peak, and most of them will leave um, after 10 o'clock in the evening as well. Um, so we looked at 
the traffic operations of each of the study area intersections under kind of three conditions. Um, and if you're kind of going around these little pie charts here, um, the upper left-hand quadrant here represents under existing conditions, the way these intersections is, are operating. Um, the sort of upper right here is under a no-build condition, so this is out in 2026. Once the mass DOT improvements are in place, um, but before the project actually gets constructed, how that would look. Um, and then the lower quadrant here represents um, once the project is built, um, what, would, what would the operations look like? So this is showing the weekday evening peak hour, and you can see that um, for the most part, all of the study area intersections will operate very similar under no build and build conditions. Um, we met with Parking and Traffic Commission to review the, the traffic operations of each of the study area intersections, and only one really had notable impact, and that obviously is the one right at our front door at the intersection here of um, Route 1A, Water Street, Front Street and, and Goat Hill, where under the weekday evening peak hour, we were seeing a level of service F coming out of um, Water Street onto Route 1A, even with the improvements in place um, by Mass DOT. So we looked at those to see um, what could be done to remove that level of service F. Um, and the site generated traffic at that intersection is only adding about five seconds per vehicle of delay and it's only increasing the queue by about one additional vehicle. Um, but obviously it's a level of service F and we don't wanna have a level of service F after spending um, all this money to improve the intersection. So we took a look at that and we found with making some minor modifications to the timings that are currently being proposed by MassDOT um, that we could improve that operations and get it back down to a level of service E, um, which is generally considered um, acceptable for, for a side street during a peak hour. Um, so we are currently coordinating with uh, MassDOT's um, consultant to try and get those timings updated in their next submission. So they just submitted their 100% design plans on August 30th. Um, and so hopefully when they do their next plans, their purchase and sale, um, or excuse me, their um, specs, then they will be able to update um, at that time with, um, with these new timings. In addition, once the project is constructed, there will be some monitoring in the field that will be done of the operations of the intersection and timings can be adjusted at that time um, to account for what the actual um, traffic volumes are that are occurring rather than just the projected volumes. Um, so that project is anticipated to begin construction, as I mentioned in the spring, and will likely take about two construction seasons to construct. Um, so either project could open first. Um, the restaurant could open first or Mass DOT's project could be open first. Um, we have agreed with the Parking and Traffic Commission that should Mass DOT's project open first, when we open, we will monitor that intersection and we will adjust the timings accordingly. Um, if we are open first, it would obviously be done by them anyway as part of their project, but in the event we open second, we will re-optimize those timings um, to make sure that everything is working well. There aren't any locations where the queues are increasing by more than one vehicle, so the lines that you're seeing here all kind of look like they're all right, one on top of each other. Um, so as I mentioned before, there are a number of pedestrian and bicycle improvements that are being proposed both as part of the Mass DOT project and as part of our project as well, connecting down to the waterfront. Um, this was something that we covered um, quite extensively in the letter that um, was just passed out to you this evening um, and that was submitted to the Parking and Traffic Commission. Um, but I just wanna to touch on it a little bit briefly so that people can understand kind of what's going on out here as part of the MassDOT project. Um, so, what is planned for this project is to reconstruct both the intersection of, of Route 1A with Water Street here, Front Street, and with the intersection of Cabot Street here. So right now there's um, a slip lane that as you're headed northbound on Route 1A just kind of peels off and flies up Cabot Street. And that can be quite dangerous for a pedestrian to try and cross that. Um, there's no pedestrian signals there. And, 
it's a little dicey as people are flying around that corner. Um, so MassDOT has proposed to eliminate that uh, slip right turn lane and put in a signalized pedestrian crossing at that location. They're reconstructing the sidewalks all the way around um, this intersection, um, narrowing the roadways down in many places um, by eliminating those slip lanes, tightening up the, the curb radii um, at each of the intersections to reduce the crossing distances for pedestrians. Um, they're upgrading all of the crosswalks with ADA compliant crossings um, with the pedestrian push buttons that will actually chirp. Um, you're probably familiar with those from up and down Rantoul Street now that have been put into place um, that will have the countdown signal heads to let you know how much time is left on the crossing as well. Um, the other component that they're adding is uh, bicycle lanes along Route 1A in each direction, which will connect up to the lanes that were just recently constructed on Rantoul Street as well. Then as you continue down into um, the Water Street site, as Scott already kind of walked through a lot of these, so I'll, I'll just touch on them very briefly, but we plan to continue the work that's being done by MassDOT um, by connecting down all the way along this um, multi-use 10 foot wide path here down to the waterfront, which will be um, a handicap accessible route down to the waterfront in that area. Um, and then also providing a connection up through here um, that you could use to get up to Route 1A via the staircase connection as well. Um, and then a number of the amenities that are going to be provided along the waterfront with the outdoor um, seating areas, the benches, the landscaping, and all of that that, um, that Scott already mentioned. So I won't go into too much detail on that component of it. So I think the big question really is the parking demand um, and where everyone is going to park in this area. Um, so the, the city planning department did a parking utilization study um, over a three day period to look at how many people are actually parking in this area around um, the Water Street site um, today and looking at how many people would be parking there in the future, what spaces are actually available um, for them to utilize. So it was done on um, September 12th and September 18th, which were two weekday evenings from about 5.40 in the evening till seven o'clock at night. And then also on um, a Saturday evening, um, September 14th, on a Saturday evening, approximately the same time to look at what is the parking utilization in this area, um, which roughly coincides with the, the peak parking for the restaurant. The restaurant would peak out a little bit later from about seven to eight o'clock in the evening, um, but is, is pretty much showing the residents um, are starting to come home in those times, parking on the street, and a lot of the businesses are still open, people are starting to leave, so it's kind of that peak time for parking in this area. Um, in total, there's 123 off-street parking spaces that are available here spread out between the Water Street lot, the Harbor Master lot, and the Creamery lot here, um, and a total of 258 on-street parking spaces that are kind of enclosed in this area here that you see um, extending basically from Lothrop Street um, all the way down to Porter Street, um, and then going up to Stone Street along here. Um, and, and those are just existing parking spaces. That's not um, a reflection of how many are occupied, but those are spaces that are actually striped or um, designated out in those areas. Um, about 35% of the off-street parking spaces were occupied during um, the peak time that was counted by, by the city, um, leaving about 80 parking spaces that would be available for restaurant patrons to utilize. Um, on the streets themselves, on average, about 47 to 55% of the spaces were occupied, depending on the day, um, with only a couple areas that really exceeded that 75% occupancy. And this map here is um, essentially showing you kind of where, where the vacant parking spaces are located. Um, so the areas that are shown in green represent the parking spaces that have a lot of availability. So there's not a lot of people that are parked in those locations. Um, there's less than 20% of the parking spaces that are actually being utilized. 
Um, as it fades down to red, that's where we get into the area where it's 80% or more of the parking spaces um, that are being occupied here. The good news is that a lot of the available parking spaces are actually the ones that are closest to the, um, to the site itself. Um, and the ones that are fuller parking spaces are located a little bit further away from the site. So that as there is some spillover from the off-street parking spaces onto the street, um, those will be in the areas. Most people will tend to go to the closest parking space that they can find on the street. And those are the areas that are not being utilized um, today. Um, so we don't anticipate a, a huge amount of displacement of parking for um, the vehicles that are already parking in this area today based on the fact that there are um, so many parking spaces available on the streets closest to um, the site itself. So this one is showing you the, the weekday evening peak hour. Um, and uh, this figure here is basically showing you the, the Saturday midday, or excuse me, the Saturday evening um, peak hour as well. Looks pretty similar. Again, 80 parking spaces available um, in the on-street parking spaces, uh, or excuse me, in the off-street parking spaces, and 143 um, parking spaces available off-street um, as well. So the next component to that was looking at well, how much parking are, are, are we going to need to service our site? Um, based on zoning requirements, um, Miranda, correct me if I'm wrong, but based on zoning requirements, we require 121 parking spaces? 89 parking spaces? Okay. So based on zoning requirements, we would only need 89 parking spaces um, to service the restaurant. but. What we looked at was actually the ITE parking um, generation rates for a um, quality restaurant as well as for the snack shack component. Now when we were considering the, the parking, um, we did not apply any credit for people who might already be in the waterfront area and parking elsewhere. We really wanted to look at what is a worst case condition of what this parking might look at or might look like. So we assumed that there would be no sharing of parking between um, our site and the surrounding area. Um, we also superimposed the peak time for the restaurant on the peak time of the adjacent street, even though they likely will not occur at the same time, um, where the restaurant will, will experience its peak um, in that seven, eight o'clock in the evening, um, and the, the street will experience its peak a little bit earlier. Um, what we found was that um, based on ITE parking generation rates, that we might generate um, a peak demand of 183 parking spaces on a weekday and 107, excuse me, 167 parking spaces on a Saturday. Um, these couple of rows down here are kind of showing where those people are most likely to go. So we mentioned that there will be offsite employee parking for 25 employees. Um, and then parking likely closest to the site, people will start in the off-street parking lots. Um, this is showing kind of about 54 to 47 vehicles that are parked in those in the Water Street lot, um, 25 to 29 parkings in the Cabot Street lot. And the Creamery lot is really about at its capacity right now. Um, it was pretty full on the, on the weekday. Um, but there are a couple of available parking spaces that people may park in those locations as well. Um, and then this area shaded in the darker blue is kind of showing how people would spill out onto the street, assuming that people will likely start at w the Water Street lot first and then spread out from there looking for parking um, out along Water Street, um, Lothrop Street, um, Rentoul Street, Wellman Street, Porter Street, and then Bartlett Street as well. Um, based on this, what we're showing is that there is a surplus of 59 parking spaces in that area that was counted by the city um, during a weekday evening peak hour, even when we're adding our peak traffic on top of um, the peak traffic for the adjacent streets. And then at a surplus of 91 parking spaces um, during that Saturday evening peak hour um, as well. Um, 
So as I mentioned, we did meet with the Parking and Traffic Commission. They did um, provide us with a favorable recommendation. Um, they had a number of conditions that they um, recommended, um, which a couple of those I've already mentioned, but I just want to mention what those other um, conditions were. So they wanted to see the post-monitoring study be done of the intersection of uh, Route 1A at Water Street and Front Street. Um, if it's not already done by MassDOT, then we would agree to do that post-monitoring study. Um, they also wanted to see monitoring of the parking and the site operations as well, and any adjustments that might be necessary um, to ensure that the site and the parking flow all work well. Um, they requested that we submit a construction operations plan to the Parking and Traffic Commission um, prior to starting construction, which would indicate locations for employees to park, um, delivery routes for materials to be brought into the site, um, the schedules, hours of operations, and those types of things. Um, also that we adopt and implement the TDM measures that I mentioned um, earlier uh, this evening, which are also included in the letter that was passed out. Um, that we provide a designated drop-off area for Uber and Lyft, um, which is another thing that can help to alleviate parking as well. Um, that was not accounted for in these numbers, but we will provide a dedicated drop-off area for Uber and Lyft, as well as for the um, employee and patron shuttle. Um, they preferred that that location be within the Harbor Master lot to keep um, the majority of the spaces available at the Water Street lot, um, so we're certainly willing to, to do that as well. Um, and they also requested that we provide a parking attendant on site for the peak hours of operation for the restaurant, um, which would include the weekday evenings in the summertime, um, and then on the weekends year round, as well as any special events um, that would occur. So those were the, the conditions that they um, had recommended. So with that, I can answer any questions that you might have, or if we want to open it to the public, I'm not sure. Questions from member of the board? Um, I have a conceptual question. Um, for an intersection that's already at an E or even a D, let alone an F, why should we add one more car to that, to that intersection, even if it doesn't bump it down a full grade? What, what, that's a failing intersection in my mind. Wh why should I find that accept acceptable, let alone, uh, you know, approve a project that's going to add at least some additional traffic to that intersection? Sure. So under existing conditions, um, that intersection is at um, a level of service E um, during the, the weekday evening peak hour. Um, there's one movement that's at a level of service F, and that's the movement coming off of Water Street. Um, but that's under existing conditions. So with the Mass DOT project, they are proposing to upgrade that signal equipment. Um, and I don't, I don't think you're answering my question. Uh, forget about specifics. You've got an intersection that's already a D, um, and and will remain a D if nothing, even if nothing happens. Uh, why should I permit, why should I approve a project that's gonna add any cars to that intersection? It's already at a D. It's, it's unacceptable as it is. Yeah, so a level of service D is, is generally considered an acceptable I know you said that before, but for, considered, for by <laughs> considered by whom? Operations. Considered by whom? In fact, so when we look at traffic operations, um, so the level of service is really, it's not telling you if there's enough room for traffic to get through. What it's telling you is how much delay does yeah. a, a driver experience. Yeah, unacceptable amount of delay. And a, a level of service D really means that a driver driving through that intersection is going to experience um, for a signalized intersection up to 50 seconds on average um, as they go through the intersection. Um, so it's not really telling you is there enough capacity or not for a vehicle to get through. There is plenty of capacity at the, at the intersection for vehicles to be able to get through. Um, it is at a level of service D, 
um, with the proposed improvements um, by Mass DOT. Okay, forget, again, forget about, I'm, I'm not talking about specific, I, I agree it's better for it to be a D than an E, but I, I still don't, and, and you know, I, I think I've heard the best answer you have, which is some people think a D should be acceptable, but I'm not getting it, and, and I'm not getting, as I say, why, why any more cars should be added to an intersection that's, that's an E or even a D. Um, certainly, if, if the intersection was at an E, I think we, we'd be seeing a lot more issues. When it's at a level of service E, you tend to see a lot of movements that are operating at a level of service F. And that starts to represent a, a failing condition where you're exceeding the capacity. But in this case, the overall intersection is at a level of service D. And for a, a city intersection, a downtown intersection on an arterial roadway, that is considered by by all means um, to be an acceptable condition. That's actually what you want to design for in general is to have a level of service C or D during your peak hours. When you go beyond that, you start um, really putting in excess capacity that doesn't get used um, during the off-peak times and you create sort of this sea of pavement out there that most of the time isn't being used. I guess I misunderstood. The, the northwest quadrant is the existing condition? Correct. So, so isn't that at an E, not a D? Currently? Correct. A D, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so this is an E today without the improvements that are being done by right. the DOT. Um, once those improvements are done, it would be at a level of service D overall. Okay. And then with the additional traffic that we would generate, it remains at a D. Um, the intersection only increases in delay. Um, I'm not sure of that specific one that I was just showing, but in general, all of the intersections have less than a two second increase in delay at any of the intersections in the study area. I assume that, the, that there's no left turn exit from the project site to the south. Um, so you can exit the site, you're talking about out onto Water Street? Is that what well, you're talking about? Yeah, I guess it's, I guess you'd be exiting to Water Street. How do you leave and go south? Yep, so if you were exiting the site to head south on Route 1A, um, you could come out of Water Street, take a, a left out of the site driveway onto Water Street, and then a left at the signal here. I think you mean a right and then a left. No, nope, it would be two lefts. Oh, I see, okay. Yep. So the actually site I can, plan? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> 